Good evening, y'all. Welcome back, or welcome for those who are here for the first time. It's another wonderful Sunday night, and we're uh, back at it learning about Arduinos again. Um, I hope everyone's had a delightful week, um, or at least a, a passable one. Um, I know there's a lot of you out there who've been working on your various Arduino projects, uh, either on a Sunday night or over the course of the past week, and that's super cool. I had at least two people text me saying, uh, hey, I, or you know, message me or something saying, I, I bought a kit after last Sunday. I see, uh, I see Michael Trudeau's in the chat who's been working on things since, since last week, which is super cool. Um, I'm glad this can be an impetus for people to just, you know, try, try new things, develop new skills, or if it's just an excuse to like turn me on in the background and play with your own project this weekend, like that's also great. Um, so yeah, so welcome back. As usual, I'm going to give people uh, just a little bit of time uh, to catch up if they uh, are running a little bit behind. Um, and actually, I realize I should uh, change what my mouse settings are so you can still see my mouse. Who will come over to the... Uh, you, don't, you don't need to look at my uh, <laughs> me changing my mouse settings. Um, but I want to hear about... And Michael, what did you um, what have you been working on this week? Um, what and you, you just got a kit, I think, in the mail a few days ago. What was the first thing you built, and what's the latest thing that you built and that you're trying out? Let's see here. Sorry, this is going to be a really boring stop of stream. Adjusting mouse settings is, like, not exactly the sexiest thing to do on stream. Um, but let's do... Make sure my mouse can get nice and visible so we can see all the things. I think that worked out really well last time. A lot of this is just going to be like on the computer and typing. Yeah, that should do it. It's going to take a second to apply. And if we come over to the computer, let's see if that took. Did you, are you capturing my cursor? You are. But of course, the text is not super easy. There we go. So there's that little that little yellow dot that we like. <laughs> Kenneth's here for the mousing adjustment. Kenneth, I think you're in... Um, I, I'm sure that there is a dedicated subculture for mouse setting adjustment. Um, that's going to be my little dip into it. Maybe we'll get a flood of mouse setting enthusiasts in here for next week. Mm. I should say, uh, tonight's stream is being featured with Bodum. Uh, Bodum is a hazy IPA from Half Acre Brewery here in Chicago. Uh, and it's just really tasty. We went to the launch party here about a year ago, and it's it's juicy, it's good. It comes in tall boys and 12 ounces now. Bodum by Half Acre. Michael says, but doing just the tutorials, uh, they give a diagram to set up on the breadboard and then code with a description of what the code means, just getting it all under my fingers. Yeah, that's a super good thing to do, right? It's a lot of this is just about getting that muscle memory of, oh, I want to do X uh, and developing some intuition for what you actually do, whether it's a digital write or an input or how you're structuring things, right? Just getting some sort of basic muscle memory about how it's all flowing is super great. Um, I wanted to show off before we dive into the content here, um, a cool project that somebody shared with me this week. We'll come back over to the computer. Um, let's see. Here we go. <laughs> this is a photo that uh, Lee Fisness, here we are, Lee Fisness and Travis Sheep sent me after last week um, of them work, <laughs> working on uh, their Arduino project with me in the background. I believe it's an Arduino controlled motorized window blinds setup. Um, we didn't get super into the detail, so I'm sure there's a lot going on here. Um, there's at least two Arduinos in the frame and an LCD display up here and a sound sensor. So I'm, I think there's extra things going on. Um, but in any case, it was just, I don't know, it's very cool. Like just to, you know, uh, do a little learning together and build some products together. And I think that's really great. Uh, Chris says, it's easier to see the LEDs if they aren't under the... Yes, Chris, thank you very much. <laughs> um, speaking of seeing LEDs, I actually, I thought I would share with you the project that I've been working on this week, um, which is based on Arduino, conveniently enough, which is a, a tally light system for my streaming setup. Um, tally lights, for those who haven't done super much film, is in a live camera setup, um, whether that's sports or a studio setup, it's not uncommon to have a little red light on top of your camera, or in the case of a, you know, a, a larger studio, a large red light that tells you which camera is active. So as someone is doing live switching in the control booth in the background, your talent, if they're really aware, <laughs> which I'm not, uh, can tell which camera is active. Um, and so I built one using an Arduino for my setup today. And I, I think I have a way to show this off. Of course, seeing something that's attached to a camera is sort of the opposite of what the setup is meant to do. But I think if I go to my table shot and I zoom all the way out, you can probably see this little red light on top of the camera here. And it's gonna be a little hard to see because right, because I'm gonna have to change views to get it to take. But right now it's showing me that this face camera is active. I'm gonna switch to the computer view and back and you'll see it turn on right as it transitions back, right? So I go to computer and you can see that little red light turn on. So that's been my project for this week. Honestly, by the end of the day today, 
you're going to know all, uh, basically anything that we would do on the Arduino side. I'll, I'll walk you through the Arduino code for it at the end of the day today. Um, there's also a program that's running on my computer and Chris is asking, want to know about the Windows setup? Yeah, so the, the interface on the computer is, um, not to get too down a rabbit hole before we dive into things tonight, um, but I, I wrote a bit of Python code um, that uses a built-in library that comes with a streaming software that listens for messages coming from the streaming code of when the scene changes. And then I've hard coded in saying, you know, when uh, the view includes this camera, turn on this light. Uh, when the view includes this camera, turn on this light. Um, and so all the Arduino is doing is saying is listening for which value should be turning on and turning them on or turning them off. Um, hopefully it helps me tonight. I was watching back through last week and camera focus is not my strong suit, it turns out, but we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, it's been a really cool week of working on things. And I think after this week, we'll, uh, we'll know a little bit more. We can build a few more things. So let's do real quick before we dive into new stuff. I want to just do a quick review of what we learned last week. And if this is your first time joining us, hello, this is very delightful. Um, this is going to be a super quick blast through basically everything that we are going to presume we know about Arduino so far. If you are brand new, like if you have never touched an Arduino before tonight, I hope you'll continue hanging out with us. Maybe this is more of an inspirational, <laughs> not inspirational, maybe this is more of a, um, a chance to think about what Arduino can do, even if some of the details are going to be a little bit thick tonight. Um, you can always go back and watch last week's stream um, from March 22nd which really started from the beginning of walking us through how to get started in Arduino code. Um, the things we talked about last week, just as like a quick review, um, we talked about the fact that all Arduino code has a setup section where the code runs once, and once that's done, it's going to run that loop function over and over and over again. Um, we also talked about the pin mode function. Um, pin mode just sets up whether an individual pin, which remember is a point of connection on the Arduino, is going to be an input or an output. And we want to just tell it which is which because it's going to behave a little bit differently and set things up for us a little bit differently, depending on whether something's an input or an output output. The digital write function, really straightforward function, right, which is going to take a singular pin and output it either high, right, up to five volts, or low down to ground. Um, and that's our high and our low setting, right? High in our context means five volts and low means ground. Sometimes 3.3 volts, but that will be determined when you buy the thing, and most of the time it's five volts. Um, we also did the flip side of that. We did the digital read, right? So if the value is about five volts, we get back high. If it's about zero volts, we get low. And in the middle, we get nothing, right? This is our, this was the graph we looked at last time, right? On the uh, output side, right? Five volts is high, zero volts is ground. On the input side, you get a lot more flexibility, right? Um, uh, anything in the range from three to five volts will give you back a high value. Anything from 1.5 to zero volts gives you a low value. And in the middle here, it's, it's, not, it's not that it's undefined. It's not going to give you back an undefined value, but it is, you're not quite sure what you're going to get. Like if you put two volts uh, on a pin and read it with a digital read, you might get high, you might get low. So it's, it's sort of best to avoid that range. Other things we learned last week, we learned about comments, right? If you put two slashes in front of a line, uh, then that line is not read by the code at all. And then it will, uh, it can just be something, a notation for ourself to remember what the code is doing. We learned about the delay function, which just delays a certain number of milliseconds, just goes to sleep, does nothing for a certain number of milliseconds, and then comes back. We talked a little about variables, right? The integer and the long integer, which are a way of storing a number uh, in our code and then coming back and using it later. We did a lot last time, y'all. I honestly can't believe, like we spent the first half hour just talking about like what an Arduino is and what the history of it is. And then we jammed through all of this in 90 minutes with some tangents. I'm really impressed with us. Um, we also talked about if then else statements, which are the basic way of stringing together behavior in our code. So it's a way of sort of thinking about in the coding language the same way we think about out loud, right? If the button is pressed, then do this other thing. Else, do this other, this third thing, right? If the pizza is too hot, then don't eat the pizza. Otherwise, eat the pizza, if then else. We took a preliminary look at for loops, which are a way of doing something multiple times. We're gonna come back to for loops today when we talk about analog output because we, there's a couple more ways you can use for loops that we didn't get into last time, and I think they'll be really helpful. We looked at the millis function a little bit. 
Millis, remember, just is a function that returns the number of milliseconds since the program started running. And that's something that the Arduino keeps track of for you, which is super handy. It's a really simple way to, if you're doing something based on timing, uh, to read sort of the current clock time for your Arduino and take some actions based on it. And then we also did some um, very basic defining of functions, right? Where we took a block of code that we wanted to use over and over again uh, and wrapped it up in this function definition so that we could uh, reuse that code without having to rewrite it every time. Let's take just a quick look at the chat. We've, that was a really quick blast through of all that we were gonna talk about last time. Um, Kenneth says, it might be interesting to some to note that delay function doesn't actually put the controller to sleep. Oh, it really just sits there and does nothing. Yeah, it's true. So there are, I, I did use the word sleep in relation to the delay function, and that's just sort of a metaphor that I like to use for describing it um, because it's sitting there doing nothing. There are ways to put microcontrollers into a, a sleep mode where they will draw less power. And if you're thinking about something that's going to be battery powered, that can actually be really useful because the Arduino spinning on its own can use some milliamps of current, which doesn't you know, it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're thinking about this thing running for days or weeks or months, you really want to be down, you know, into the like microamps range on average, right? So it might go to sleep, use less power for, you know, an hour, and then a very low level process that's drawing hardly any power at all will wake it up, do a high current thing, you know, costing some milliamps for a few seconds and shut itself off. If you think about like uh, remote temperature sensors or humidity sensors, you know, in, in the wilderness, this is essentially what they're doing, right? They're out they're on a battery, maybe with a little solar cell. They're drawing a very low current most of the time. They're waking up for a few seconds, doing their thing, probably sending out a radio signal with their data or writing it to an SD card and then going back to sleep. Yeah, interesting point, Kenneth. Um, so those are all the things we talked about last time. Let's talk a little bit about, just as a preview of what we're gonna do today. Um, uh, remember, <laughs> my favorite metaphor for what an Arduino is, right? Uh, an Arduino or a computer is a device that takes some inputs, does some thinking, and produce some outputs. And I'm not ready to let that metaphor go yet. So that's how we're gonna break things down today. Not necessarily in this order. On the input side, we're gonna talk about serial input. Uh, and before anybody says it, I'm not talking about honey bunches of oats. Um, Serial input, a way of getting data from uh, an outside device like a computer or another Arduino onto our Arduino to react to it. We'll also look at analog input, right? So far we've been looking at voltage at uh, inputs that only have two states, high and low. What if we could have a range of values in the middle? That's analog input. On the output side, we'll also talk about serial output that's sending data out from the Arduino to the computer or to another Arduino or to another source. We'll look at analog output or at least what the Arduino does for analog output and why those quotes are there. Um, and we'll, we look at the tone function. Arduino has a built-in function that uh, can output tones. Uh, by tones, I mean musical notes to a pin, um, which as you're getting into experimenting with Arduino can be a really helpful thing either to alert you that there's an error going on or demonstrate uh, some kind of reactive value. Um, I just think it's nice to be able to make your computers beep and bloop. Uh, on the thinking side of things, um, we're going to talk again a little bit about time. Uh, Palmer asked a question last week about how do you make a program that uh, basically waits for something to happen, uh, takes an action, and then waits for that thing to happen again. And we got into that a little bit, but I, I'd sort of like to return to this question of how do we write a piece of code that essentially waits for inputs and then takes some actions? Because it's sort of a parallel question to how do we have an Arduino that does multiple things at once? And in the example, one of those things is, well, nothing, and the other is do something. Um, but I think it's a good thing to start thinking about early. Um, we'll look at the map and constraint functions, which are a way of uh, translating certain values to certain other values. Uh, and we'll expand a little bit more on variables. We're gonna look at strings today, which is a way of encapsulating text. And we're gonna look at arrays. Last time we introduced very vaguely and hand wavily the idea of data structures, right? I said that there is value in not just having individual labels for all of the bits of information, all the variables you want to remember, but that there's structured ways, lists and things, ways of thinking about it. The array is the first one of those that we're gonna look at. Um, it's a super common and super useful data structure. Um, and the Arduino handles it and C++ handles it a little bit differently from some of the languages you may have worked with. So we'll look at the specifics and uh, we'll look at how it's useful. Yeah, seems like a place to start. Let's just check the chat real quick and see if there's any further questions. Uh, better than talking about serial with a C output. Yes, I, the moment that I told my wife Mary that I was handling serial output today, she asked me about grape nuts. Uh, you know, what can you do? Uh, all right. Without any further ado, 
let's zoom this camera back in and we'll get to talking about analog output, which you can think of in this contest like dimming, right? Uh, a digital output, digital, right, ones and zeros means things are either on or they're off, they're high or they're low. Analog means a continuous range of values or at least a multiplicity of values in between. Um, so in our situation, um, analog output, you know, in, in a perfect world, if we had true analog output, our voltage could take anything, any possible value within a range, right? Could be zero volts, could be five volts, could be 4.7 volts, could be 2.696 volts. And that would be a true analog output. Uh, what the Arduino does instead, because generating an analog voltage in that way is just a little bit more complex than doing it digitally, Arduino sort of fudges this with something called pulse width modulation. And we're going to do a demo of this in just a second here, but just to give you a sense of what it is, um, let's take a look at this, this graph right here. Um, let's say that we wanted to out, output a voltage of 2.5 volts. Uh, well, we don't have a direct way of doing that, but what we can do is much like the middle portion of this graph here, we could output five volts half the time and zero volts the other half of the time. And if whatever we were hooking into, uh, a light source, a sensor, a capacitor that's storing and releasing energy, is slow enough to react that it doesn't really matter that things are slamming between five volts and zero volts, what we'll end up with is an effect that's much like having the average voltage of this waveform, right? It'll sit right in the middle there at 2.5 volts. It's important to remember that at no point in this waveform, other than these little spots where it's passing right through that line, are we actually at two and a half volts? So there are some situations and some circuits where this will not give you the intended result, right? You don't really have two and a half volts there. Uh, but for something like, for example, an LED light. Um, the frequency that this wave is oscillating at for the Arduino is about 490 hertz, right? 490 times on and off every second. And for almost every application, especially for the human eyes, that is so fast that the effect just blurs together. And rather, rather than seeing on, off, on, off, we see the average brightness of those two, which is about 50% brightness. Um, the same is true uh, of, you know, if we if we choose a value other than 50%, we might say we want uh, our LED to be as a quarter as bright as when it's on at full all the time, right? So we could have our signal be high, be at five volts for a quarter of the time and off for three quarters of the time. And so on average, we would get about as quarter as much, about a quarter as much light coming out of it. Um, the term for how long the signal is on or high for is the duty cycle. And that's what these values are here, right? So a 50% duty cycle means on half the time and off half the time. A 25% duty cycle means on for 25% of the time and off for 75% of the time and so on, right? 100% duty cycle is just on. 0% duty cycle is just off. Uh, and you can do um, many different values in between. In the case of the Arduino, the number of possible values for a PW UM output is 256. Um, and we'll, when we write the code for this in just a second, you'll see um, why that's important. Um, so we have any of 256 possible widths of these pulses uh, to choose from. So we are possible values are 0% and a uh, 1 256th percent and 2 256th percent and so on, smoothly up to 100%, right? So in just a moment here, we'll take a little a look at the code and we'll see what that means. I just want to check and see if there's any any clarifications. Chris says, at what cycle rate does the human eye recognize? Tangent question. Oh, it's a good question. The one that Kenneth's already answering. Um, yeah, it is complicated. You know, uh, if you think about television in the United States up until the advent of high def running at uh, 60 hertz or 30, 30 hertz interlaced, right? Those images for a lot of intents and purposes feel smooth, right? An old fashioned television didn't feel twitchy and jerky. Um, but part of that, to be fair, is part of the, you know, the persistence of the phosphor in those TVs creating a little bit of a stretching effect. Um, some people claim to see a difference between when their monitors run at 60 hertz versus 144 hertz versus like the new 300 and something hertz monitors. I don't see a difference, but I totally believe people that do. Um, if you think about watching, you know, a movie in 30 frames a second versus a basketball game in 60 frames a second, and the basketball game just seems extra crisp and extra reactive and sharp, that's sort of the difference between 30 and 60. 490 hertz for all intents and purposes for the human eye is faster than anyone's going to be able to perceive. But, and this will be the last thing of the tangent, and Kenneth can carry on in the chat or anyone else can if they feel like it, um, it can be important for thinking about lighting on camera. 
And I think I have my setup set up so that you won't see uh, any flickering on camera, but with a high enough frame rate, right? You might think about uh, these pulses of light coming out of, out of an LED at 490 times a second. If your shutter rate is a thousandth of a second, it might not be open long enough to catch one of those pulses every single time. And so uh, when you're thinking about lighting for film or TV or camera, often you're thinking about light sources that have a very, very high uh, pulse width mod modulation rate up into like the thousands or tens of thousands of hertz just so uh, even for a very short f uh, frame rate a very short camera lens uh, camera shutter opening you will still get that sort of stretching that sort of averaging value if that sort of makes sense really good question um, let's look at how we do analog uh, pulse width modulation in Arduino code so come over here to our IDE I'm gonna start a brand new sketch for y'all. I'm just gonna double check, things look good. All right, um, so um, this is gonna look a lot like our blink sketch from last time, right? Um, I am going to first define a variable called LED pin. It's gonna be which pin my, uh, my LED is hooked up to here. Uh, at the moment it's on pin three and I have a little current limiting resistor in here like last time. We'll talk about current limiting and why you use it with LEDs I think next week. But for now, uh, this is a one kilo ohm resistor for what it's worth. Um, so, uh, as always, I'm going to define the uh, LED pin as an output, right? So uh, that it will output sufficiently. Um, and then uh, let's just do the simplest possible example. So here is the command for doing analog output on an Arduino. It is simply analog write the pin value and then a value between zero and 255, right? I said there are 256 possible values of, of uh, pulse widths in this system. Uh, so they run from zero to 255 instead of one to 256. A lot of things when you're thinking about programming, a lot of the counting starts at zero. Um, so let's start with 255, which will be full, which will be a 100% duty cycle and will be entirely on. Uh, it's gonna make me save that real quick. And I'm going to upload and we'll come over here. In fact, let me, <laughs> let me get this out of the way for a second. Um, We'll get to the oscilloscope in just a second here, but let me zoom in a little bit. I think this will be decently visible on camera. Um, so that's uh, at brightness level 255 out of 255. That's full brightness. What happens if I knock it down to 25? We'll upload again, come back over here, and now you can see it's significantly dimmer, or at least I can. I think it shows up on screen. Um, so th that's the gist of an analog output. You give it a value between 0 and 255, and you get a proportional uh, pulse width on the output, right? Um, and just to show you a little bit uh, more clearly that it is changing in value, um, let's get to uh, using a for loop to make this thing dim. So a for loop, you'll remember from last time, is a way of running the same bit of code multiple times, and the syntax was uh, had three parts in these parentheses here, right? We had uh, a declaration of a looping variable, uh, the state for when to continue, and the incrementation step. And we wrap it all up in curly brackets. I knew I just, I blew through that that uh, explanation of, of a for loop. Um, if you want the more thorough definition, check out last week's stream. Um, but just a reminder, right? So uh, this is gonna run 256 times, right? We're gonna start at zero and we go until this is 255, because when it's 256, we're done. And every time we'll use this shorthand, I++, to increment this, this variable I by one. Um, so one thing that we didn't do last week, um, we just sort of used this for loop to do something multiple times. We can actually use this variable i inside the for loop, right? So instead of doing a an LED value here uh, to write to, I can actually use this variable i as the value to write to the LEDs, right? So what this is gonna do is the first time through this loop, this will be zero. So it's gonna do analog write LED pin zero. And then it's gonna loop back around where I is one and it will do analog write LED pin one and then analog write LED pin two and so on. Uh, and it will continue that until it reaches 255, it will be done. We'll, we'll leave our for loop. And then because we're inside this loop function, we'll do it all over again. Um, just to space things out a little bit, I'm gonna put a small delay in here as well. Just delay five milliseconds. Um, just so this thing isn't running as fast as possible, I want us to be able to see the effect. So if I upload that, come back over here to our table, and now you'll see our LED starting at zero and fading up to full over and over again. Let's see here. PF janky side, are the spaces between the equal sign required? No, there's a lot of flexibility in formatting. I like spaces in between my equal signs, but, but they're certainly not required. I think Kenneth caught that too. Um, 
So there's our fading LED demo, right? Uh, if I wanted to do the classic breathing LED demo, right, that Apple has made so, so popular, um, I could follow this up with an identical for loop right after it, right? So this is gonna be our bit of code we already have. That's gonna be the breathing, call that the breathing in section of the code, right? Um, and next I'm going to write the breathing out section of the code, um, which will look very similar, except instead of starting at zero and going up to 255, I'm going to start at 255. I'm going to count down to zero. And I'm going to use this greater than or equal to symbol here because I want zero to be included in this loop. And instead of I plus plus, we have a similar operator called minus minus, which just takes one away from I. These are situations, right? There's a whole lot of times when you want to just add one to a variable or subtract one from a variable. And so being able to type I minus minus rather than I equals I minus one is just a little bit, it's a little bit shorter. It's a little bit cleaner. It's another thing to remember, but once you get used to it, it's very, um, very easy to use. Um, so if I upload this code now, come back over here, we should see the LED breathing in and breathing out and breathing in and breathing out. That's the classic Apple breathe in, breathe out LED. Kenneth says it's not fading, it's brightening. Um, oh, Kenneth also picks up a good example in the chat, which is probably worth calling out. Um, there's another uh, shorthand you can use for assignment here, right? Um, so right, I, I did I minus minus instead of I equals I minus one. You can also use this shorthand, which is I minus equals, minus equals one, um, which just says subtract this value on the right from this variable on the left. Again, adding things and subtracting things is just so common that it's nice to have some shorthand for it. So for now, I'm just gonna leave this as I minus minus, right? So there's our classic breathing LED. Um, just to give you a little bit of a sense of what is actually going on uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the electrons, so to speak, when we're doing this, um, I have brought out my oscilloscope. And we could do a whole evening on using oscilloscopes. Um, and I would, uh, I'd be super excited to do that. And maybe we will at some point, because at some point, you know, in a seven or eight years, we'll run out of things about the Arduino to talk about. Um, but I, uh, for the time being, you can think of the oscilloscope as essentially graphing voltages for you. Um, I want to bring up a graph that we looked at last time. In fact, you can, you can just look at this graph, right? Um, when I presented this graph to you and said, here's how the, uh, the levels in this pin are going, I, you probably pretty instinctively understood this is a graph of voltage over time, right? With time running along the x-axis here and voltage running along the y-axis, right? And really that's all an oscilloscope does is it's graphing voltage over time for you. The advantage of using an oscilloscope rather than trying to do this by hand, kind of like we did last time with a multimeter, a multimeter is only gonna update two, maybe three times a second. An oscilloscope is gonna redraw that display for you thousands or millions or for the expensive ones, billions of times a second. And so it's going to make a graph for us of what's happening uh, with the, the pins that we are hooked into uh, on our circuit board here. Um, just real quick before we do, just so we can see a little bit better what's happening over there. I'm gonna take this delay that's happening on our breathing example. I'm going to give it a name uh, let's make it 15 milliseconds because uh, I think we're going to want to be able to play with that. And I'm going to inject it into our code there as our delay value and re-upload. I think that'll just make things a little bit easier to see if that breathing is a little bit slower, right? So we'll come over here to our table. And again, we're not going to do a full oscilloscope demo, um, but um, basically what I'm doing is, and I, I know you can't see the display right now. I'm going to turn off one of these lights before we actually start looking at the images on the screen. Um, but I'm going to, for good practice, unplug the Arduino so it's unpowered. And I'm going to clip these probes, one to ground and one to the positive side of the LED. So I'm looking at the voltage that's being uh, presented across the LED at any given moment. I'm going to untangle my cables because that's also good practice. And make sure we can still see everything. That yeah, seems pretty good. I think you can still see the LED there. If I haven't jiggered any wires out, when I plug this back in, we should still see that that breathing demo should start up again. Yeah, there we go. And a little bit slower this time, right? Which is what we want. I think it'll make it things easier to see on the screen here. So I'm gonna turn off one of these lights. Ooh, spooky. Welcome to evenings with the Arduino. Um, but hopefully you can see, yeah, you can see the screen a little bit better now. Um, and so what you're seeing here is a graph of exactly that kind of pulse width modulation that we were looking at. And each one of those pulses, right? Each one of these values on the screen is 
a, a variable pulse. And you'll see as the Arduino gets dim, as the LED gets dim, those pulses shrink. And as it gets brighter, those pulses get longer. And we're just currently moving in a loop, right, where that gets very small and then it gets very big. We're actually, when it gets as big as it can be and as small as it can be, we're not seeing that because the our, uh, oscilloscope relies on the transition between those two states to tell it when to start graphing in a way. Um, and when it's just at zero and off or just on at high, it doesn't know when to start graphing things, right? But you can see that, that change in pulse width moving back and forth here. You can get a few more pulses on screen. You can see that a bit more directly. So I, I hope this sort of makes sense, right? We're not actually providing an analog value, right? We're not providing um, as some kind of uh, intermediate analog voltage, right, which would be in between here somewhere. We're providing a series of pulses about uh, 400 times a second. In fact, I think we can measure that on here. Yeah, I don't know if you can see this on camera. Here, let's come even bigger. Um, the frequency here says 489.7 hertz, right? So it's turning on and off 489.7 times a second every second, right? So the frequency isn't changing, just the width that the, the actual pulse is as high, you know, how long it stays high for within each pulse. Hence the term, if you haven't gotten that already, pulse width modulation, right? Pretty cool. Um, let's get rid of this guy. I want to do one more demo with uh, analog output and then we'll jump to serial communication. So we'll turn that off. We'll turn the work lights back on. We'll unplug our oscilloscope and we'll chuck it out of the way. <laughs> this is the demo that I uh, discovered that I have maxed out the number of webcams that I can currently attach to my computer. Um, the answer is three because there are three USB 3.0 ports. And if I, uh, for whatever reason at the moment, Windows is telling me I can't hook uh, any more webcams to those ports uh, without o overwhelming the bandwidth of a single port, which is all right. This means we have to do things on the workstation. All right, so uh, the demo I want to do before I move on to serial is um, trying to get away from this delay function, this sit here and do nothing function. Um, because as we sort of talked about last week, while you're in the middle of a delay function, you can't do anything else, right? As Kenneth said earlier in the chat, you are just, the Arduino has been asked to just sit there and spin its wheels for a certain number of milliseconds. Um, you can also, for what it's worth, I believe, if I get this right, um, there is a, a value to, um, a function to delay a certain number of microseconds as well if you want to. Um, but most of the time you're going to be delaying for milliseconds because what you're looking for is effects on a human scale and not on a code level scale. Um, but in any case, right, so we've written this code, it's, it's got this breathing LED, it looks really good, but the way that we've written it, we can't really integrate it with any other code because we've got these delay functions in here. We're just going to sit here and spin our wheels and do nothing. Um, and so what I'd like to do is refactor this code, refactor meaning just to rewrite in a way that does something different, um, in a way that doesn't make use of delay, which will be a really good practice for um, writing code in general that doesn't block us from doing other things, right? And to start, I'm actually going to delete the breathing out section. I'm just going to go back to breathing in over and over again. So um, here's what we're going to think about. We are uh, going to break out of this for, in fact, let's just, let's, let's comment this out, right? So we can still look at it and compare to it later, right? And we looked at block comments last week too. If you do slash asterisk and the asterisk slash later on, you get this block comment where everything in between it is commented out and doesn't do anything. Um, so we will rewrite this code in a way that takes advantage of the millis function. So when I'm making use of time in my code, I like to first um, read its value uh, into a variable. In this case, I'm gonna call current time. We could call millis every time, you know, if we're gonna need it multiple times throughout our loop, we could call it every time. It's a little bit um, less expensive in terms of um, clock cycles in terms of actual instructions to just read it once. And this also guarantees that, right, if I if I need to reference it multiple times, the chime, time isn't changing between one line of code and the next and doing something that we didn't intend, right? So I'm going to record the current time into this millis function. Um, and then I'm going to uh, use the value of the time to uh, determine the brightness of my LED pin. So in this case, I could do something like analog write LED pin uh, current time. Uh, I'll, I'll just upload that and show you what it'll do. Oh, let's see. Oh, LED wasn't defined. Yes. Full of typos. Um, as we learned last week, the code editor doesn't protect you from typos. It does exactly what you want. And if it, uh, if you give it a name you haven't told it about before, it'll throw up in your face, right? So we come over here to the table. We can see 
LED flashing, right? So that's going to take about 256 milliseconds to cycle through the values from uh, 0 to 255 and then reset back to 0. Uh, it turns out the analog write function, uh, if you give it a value bigger than 256, it will, re uh, it will output uh, the value that you've given it modulo 256 and i think we looked at the modulo operator last time but just in case we didn't oh we did we, we definitely did we definitely did but as a refresher uh the modulo operator right is written as say 79 uh mod 59 is equal to 20 right you were getting the uh, remainder when you divide the first value by the second value. So in this case, what, what we're getting here for current time is really more accurately current time mod 256, right? This is doing it, this happens for you in inside of this function. Um, so you, this hopefully isn't too surprising, um, but uh, this is more properly what it's doing here, right? So if I upload this, we should see exactly the same thing. And we do, there we go. Um, is current time literally the clock time, says PF Janky? Ah, no. So current time is just, um, the Arduino keeps a running count of the number of milliseconds since we started running the code. It's just a really easy way to, because most of the time we don't care about the time on the clock. We care about keeping some internally consistent rhythm. And uh, the millis function is just a really easy way to do that. It counts up by a thousand every second. There are ways to get actual clock time, either from a, a dedicated piece of hardware. For anyone, and I, PF Janky, I'm saying this because I know you have, if you've ever gotten into a computer and had to change out the little watch battery, the little CMOS battery, that battery is in there partially to keep its little tiny internal wall clock running. You can buy modules that essentially are that. They're a watch battery, a little tiny chip that's just supposed to keep the time pretty decently. Um, and when the Arduino asks for it over a, a, a specific protocol, will give you the wall clock time. So if you have an Arduino project that requires the time on the clock, that's a really easy way to do it, right? You tell this little tiny external chip with a battery on it, hey, here's the time now, and any time in the future, you can ask for it back. Um, so we have our, uh, our analog pin currently um, breathing in, but breathing in rather fast, right? We were going to try and replicate this code we wrote earlier with this delay. We haven't quite done that yet. So if we wanted to uh, slow down the breathing rate, we would essentially be slowing down the passage of time for the sake of this code, right? Uh, let me show you what I mean. Um, if we wanted to slow this down by, say, a factor of four, what I could do is say current time divided by four mod 256. If current time is increasing by a thousand count every second, by definition, current time divided by four is going to decrease, going to increase a quarter as quickly, right? So if I upload that, come back over here, and now we can see it's breathing in at a quarter the speed, right? About a second. Um, and that is closer to what we want, right? We can get specific about exactly how long that period is in a second here. Um, but that's one way to start thinking about like, instead of uh, delaying, instead of pausing in between each thing, thinking about how can my uh, brightness be defined as a factor of time. Um, so to complete the effect, I'm going to replicate the second part of our code, which is the breathing out. Um, and let's say, um, here's what we will do. So, right, we now sort of have two different sets of behavior. I want this to first breathe in, and then I want to breathe out. Um, and I, so depending on sort of where we are in time, I'm going to have to make a choice about two different things. So here's how I'm going to accomplish that. Um, I am going to say, uh, I'm going to use an if-then statement. So I'm going to, first we'll make the form of it, right? If the thing in the curly brackets uh, do the thing, uh, otherwise, with my else statement, uh, do the other thing. In this case, do the thing is going to be breathe in. Uh, else, do the other thing is going to be, I just typed it again, going to be breathe out, right? So, what's going to go in our if statement? Um, so, let's say, for the sake of argument, that our uh, period of oscillation, our, our total amount of time that we're going to spend uh, breathing in and breathing out um, is... Uh, we'll call that our period, is equal to uh, 256 uh, times uh, 15 milliseconds. 
uh, times two, right? So in our previous code here, we delayed for 15 milliseconds uh, for each of 256 values while you're breathing in. And then we delayed for 15 milliseconds, 256 times while breathing out. So the total amount of time we took was this number of milliseconds, 256 times 15 times 12. I could get a pocket calculator and figure that out or do it on my computer, but I can also just let the Arduino code take care of that for me, right? So now that I have our period, here's what I can do. I can say if current time uh, is less than the, uh, let's see, current time mod period divided by two is, so thinking while I type is a little bit complicated, greater than mod, uh, let's see, let me make sure I get this right. Current time mod period, yes, is less than period divided by two. So here's what's happening there, right? If the current time uh, divided by the period, we take the remainder, right? Because really all I'm interested in, like in, in my cycle of thinking about this code, am I in the, the first half of one period or the second? Am I, if I'm in the first, I'll breathe in. If I'm in the second, I'll breathe out, right? So if I'm less than the period divided by two, then I am going to uh, breathe in. And we already have code for that. Um, and that is current time uh, mod 256 times 15. I really should, <laughs> I've, I've sloppied up my variables a little bit here with a, a little bit more complicated example than I wanted to, right? Um, but this, remember, this is the, uh, let's see, mod 256. If I, if I goof this up too badly, I wrote this code in advance and I could go to it. I have sort of one in the oven prepared earlier. Um, but, uh, but I think I can get this right here. Um, so if I'm in the second half of the period, I want to uh, output to my LED my breathing out uh, value, which will be uh, 256 minus current time mod 256. I think that's I think that's wrong. I think I've made an error somewhere. Well, I've certainly I've made a typo, which is not going to help anything. Um, let's wrap that up in parentheses and we'll upload. Jeff really likes pizza, one in the oven. Yeah, I I don't know. I, I always do these streams after dinner, which you would think would make me sort of less uh, sort of oriented in, in sort of food metaphors, but there you go. Yeah, so I clearly, <laughs> this is clearly not what I meant to do. This took me a little bit of troubleshooting, so I'm going to actually uh, <laughs> open up the code that I wrote earlier because the point of tonight is not the uh, this particular bit of code, but some more general things. But let's see here. Let me open my dimmer demo. And I can walk you through it. Let's see, dim demo three, I think, was my code. Yeah, uh huh. So I use some slightly different, um, some slightly different variable names here. Um, so um, basically, what I want you to take away from this, right, is not this specific solution, but is basically that the taking the current time modulo your total period is a really easy way to think, think stop thinking about time as one long continuous stretch and start thinking about it in chunks in terms of a current uh, amount of time you want to think about, right? Where if I'm doing something over and over and over again, I don't really care that I am 47 seconds into my code. I just care that I'm uh, one second beyond f an even number, right? 46 seconds. And I want the same thing to happen again at 49 seconds and 51 seconds and so on, right? So it's probably not worth actually stepping through this whole code because actually using some things that we we haven't talked about yet. Um, but at least that's the uh, <laughs> that's the point that I was trying to make, if a little bit a little bit in a backwards way. Um, maybe we'll come back to that code when we've learned those other concepts this evening and we can we can walk through it in more detail. So sorry for the tease. Um, that I think is it. Um, not for tonight, but for analog output for the moment. We'll do a little bit more when we have cereal under my belt. Um, I'm going to take a nice sip of my cold, tasty Bodum from Half Acre Brewery. Um, questions that we haven't answered so far? Oh, that's really good. I, I was doubtful, but I'm, I got to tell you, the little tally lights that I have on top of my camera really are helping me um, focus on the, uh, on the correct camera for, for what we're doing at the moment. Oh, yeah, it's really cool. A side tangent if people are asking questions in the background. Um, it's really cool when you make things and get to use them. So if you're, I don't know if I said this last week, but a question I get asked a lot is like, hey, I want to get started with Arduino. Where do I start? What should I do? Um, and my advice is always find something you want to do or find something you need or want because that will that will drive you better than any amount of sort of vague desire to learn, right? 
And so I hope some of what we're doing here is not only teaching some skills and some coding, but also just exposing you to the kinds of things that Arduino can do um, so that you start thinking about, oh, wow, I really would like to have a sensor. I'm trying to think of a not a food-based metaphor now. I really do want an Arduino program that uh, determines uh, when I sit in my chair for more than 60 minutes uh, at a time wants to uh, flash a light in my face to remind me to get up, right? I really would like that. And that will motivate you to build the thing. Let's see, a few questions. Megan says, do you have the code posted somewhere we can pull from? I don't currently, but I should, huh? Um, let me um, let me do that after the stream tonight and I'll put it in the next group invite. It'll either be um, on, you know what, what it'll be? I'll put a link to it on my blog, which the reference is right down here, just right down there. Um, Jeff.glash slash blog. I'll put a post up for each of these videos um, and that will have links to all the applicable code. I'll probably put the code on, on GitHub, which is a code sharing website, but that'll be an easy way for me to right down here, make updates uh, to where the code is actually posted. Uh, truth to find the product to learn. Yeah, I should. I really should be posting the code. If not beforehand, then at least afterward, right? I, I had a thought like some of the code we wrote last time in real time would actually be really good to, to dig back into. So good question. Thanks, y'all. Um, let's talk about serial communication. So I'll load the slides back up. So serial, spelled with an S, uh, is... Uh, in vague hand wavy terms, a means of getting data from an outside device to the Arduino or another way of um, taking data that's on the Arduino and getting it to an outside device. Uh, often a computer or a computerized device, but there's no reason you couldn't use the Arduino to communicate with another Arduino or another microcontroller. Um, and that is done via a piece of hardware built into the Arduino called a UART, uh, a UART, a Universal Asynchronous Receiver and Transmitter. Um, and these are the two pins that you may have seen on your Arduino. They are the same as digital pins 0 and 1. And on almost all Arduinos, they are labeled TX and RX, or at least they should be. Can you see that there? TX and RX. I mean, mine actually has little adorable labels on it. Reminds you, RX is 0 is coming in. TX is 1 is going out. And if you were to connect two devices together, you would connect them with the TX pin of one UART, one device, into the RX pin of the other device and vice versa, right? TX for transmit, RX for receive. You'd also want them to share a common ground. Um, one of the nice things about the Arduino platform is, especially for something like the Arduino Uno or really any of the other variants, the uh, USB chip that is responsible for making sure that your computer can talk to the microprocessor has this UART uh, hardware built right into it. So you can actually communicate directly with your Arduino without any additional hardware in most cases. Um, now, when we say communicate, um, the, the details of this graph really do not worry about. Um, all I want to get across is uh, that you're literally sending a number of ones and zeros down the wire out of your computer into your Arduino to communicate a chunk of data, um, or vice versa. You could be sending data in ones and zeros out of your Arduino into your computer to communicate a value or, or something like that. Um, so, <laughs> oh yeah, here's our circuit diagram for our next example. It's just the Arduino. We're gonna do the first examples um, using no additional outside hardware. So if you are playing with this, this is a really easy thing to play with uh, if you're just sitting on the couch, right? You can't spend all day necessarily at the workbench. Um, Serial is a fun thing to play with because you just need to have your Arduino hooked up. So here it is gonna be sitting here all in its lonesome. And you probably need a little closer view of that. Um, so let me show you the basics of serial communication. I'm gonna start a brand new sketch. Again, I did, yeah, I, yeah. Sorry, little brain fart. Um, I am going to, I'm actually not gonna define any variables. I am simply going to start with in our setup code, the following, serial.begin9600. Um, and I'll explain where that 9600 came from in a sec. And then in my loop, I'm going to use this function, serial.printline, P-R-I-N-T-L-N, printline, uh, hello world. Uh, hello world is in quotes, right? Um, which we'll see why that in a second too. And I'm going to delay 1000 and we'll upload. Make me save. I'm going to call this serial demo today and upload. Come back over here. Well, we don't need to really, we don't really need to come back over here. There's really nothing to see over here, right? Everything that we're going to look at is going to be on our computer. And here's how we look at it. Um, in your Arduino programming editor, if you go up to tools and come down to serial monitor or on a window, machine, the default is Control-Shift-M or Command-Shift-M on a Mac, you will open up 
this serial monitor, which literally just monitors a serial port uh, that your computer has created for you between your device and your Arduino. And we can see that my computer is seeing the value hello world come in from my Arduino once a second. Now, some caveats if you're trying this for the first time, there are some settings that have to match. Um, with, namely, down here at the bottom, and I'm, I'm sorry I can't increase the, this font size anymore, so you may just have to trust me. Um, we have three different settings. Uh, one that says uh, line ending or new line, and we'll get to that when we get to you and uh, serial input. We have this 9600 baud, and this number must match the number that you have provided to your code up here in the begin function. These are also uh, the values that you are allowed to put in this uh, this begin function. And what those are is the baud rate of your communication. Um, right now, I'm sending information between the Arduino and the computer at 9600 baud. In this case, you can think about that as 9600 bits per second, right? So when we when we think about these bits of ones and zeros going back and forth, we're going to be sending a maximum of 9600 of those a second. There are lots of different values here, right? We can see we can send it 9,600, we can send it uh, 19,200, all the way up. The highest one that I would sort of commonly use in practice is uh, 115,200. Uh, um, but the Arduino hardware, in theory, can go up to uh, two megabaud, right? Two million ones and zeros per second. Um, if I get that setting wrong, right? Or if I don't match those settings between my serial monitor and my code, you'll see we've stopped receiving input. Um, but I can also always change the code to match. So I know it was hard to see on the screen there, but I just changed that value in my serial monitor to 115200. And then if I open my monitor again, I'll clear my output. We see we have hello world coming in over and over again, right? So what can you do with a serial output from the Arduino? Well, you can do lots of things, right? It's a really easy way of like, uh, if you have a big complicated section of code, I'm definitely guilty of saying, I'm not sure if this chunk of my code is ever running. Um, I'll put a serial command in there that just says, hey, I just ran code ABC. And when it shows up, I go, ah, that's when it ran that code. Okay, that's good. Or if it never shows up, I know something's gone wrong, right? Maybe I've got an if statement that uh, never evaluates to true, right? I could say something like, let's do actual examples. I could do if zero equals one, print hello world, right? Now, as some of you have probably guessed, zero never equals one. So if I open my serial monitor now, I will see no messages, right? That's a really easy way of just evaluating that your code is doing something. Um, you can also, you don't have to output just text. You can also output numbers, right? I could say, um, uh, once a second here, output the number five. <laughs> it won't be very interesting, but I can. And then if I open my serial monitor, about once a second, I get a number five. Um, I can also output the number uh, from a variable, right? I could say int uh, current time is a great example because we were just working with that. Uh, will it be our millis value? Uh, I can print current time, right? So this might be a way if you're not sure what values your variable is taking over the course of your code, um, you could have the serial interface print them back to your computer. And so you can see I'm getting a response from my Arduino about once a second, right? It's not exactly, you know, the, the millis counter and the delay counter are not quite lining up, but about once a second, I'm getting that value of millis. This actually might be a really useful troubleshooting example. If you were thinking about like, you know, I'm doing something, you know, I, about once a second, I always assume that millis would be a nice round thousands number, um, but it's not, something is drifting somewhere. This would be a really easy way to see that. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the gist of the print line command with serial. There is also a print command, and the difference between the two is that a print line command, what did I say? Oh, I deleted my current time definition. Print line command. Uh, the print line uh, automatically adds to the end of its own output a character, a, a bit of data that says, um, hey, receiving device, uh, when, you, when you've done outputting this to the screen, you should add a new line after it. You should like, basically hit enter on your keyboard um, and display the next data on a new line. If you just do print, you get what you have here, which is that the data will immediately become appended to your current data, which is sometimes what you want, sometimes not. Um, a situation where you might want that, right? I, I don't know about you, but this seems like kind of an unreadable mess to me. It's, it's you know, if I'm just looking for milliseconds, it's, it's not really what I want. Um, but uh, a situation where you might want it is, uh, let's say I did something like serial.println, the current time is, 
and close that in quotes. Uh, I could do that as a print statement, and then I could print line the current time, right? So what is this gonna do? It's going to output and say the current time is, with no hitting of the enter key, right? No new line, going to print the current time, and then because this is a print line statement, start a new line for me, right? So let's upload that. We will open up our serial monitor. Oops, oops, ah, I messed up my code. <laughs> print line, we'll upload that. We'll open our serial monitor. And now we should see the current time is, right? A little way of just, just tagging, tagging your data for interaction, right? So that's a useful thing. Um, there is a way to actually combine these two things into a single line, right? Uh, and I'm gonna show you the broken version first and then I'm gonna fix it for you. So um, we can actually use the plus operator here to, con uh, to think about concatenating two strings together. Concatenating just means smushing together, right? So uh, naively, we might think I could just do the current time is and then also print the current time for me. And you'll see I put a space in here for readability. If you don't put a space, it will jam them together for you. If I've done my example right, this will be very broken. <laughs> Yes, good. We're excellently broken, right? So that looks like hot garbage. Why is that? Well, um, this plus operator, as we know, also means addition. Um, and so when I say the current time is, and then current time, um, it's trying to figure out whether I mean, is this a string? And I want to append the string that is the number, a string being text, right? Is this text smooshing together with text? Or should I be adding these two values together like numbers? And it's because I've got a bit of text and a bit of number, it's not entirely sure. So why don't I clean things up for it with this new function that's just called string. And all that the string function does is take whatever you've put in its parentheses and turn it definitely into text, right? Where this current time before is a number, right? And represents, you know, a, a value uh, between, actually between, if I make it a long integer, between uh, zero and four billion, right? This is saying, hey, I don't want the number representation of 2000. I want the text symbols two zero zero zero, right? Um, this is an example of something called casting. Um, which this is uh, casting the current time to a string. Casting, you can think of sort of like casting an actor in a show, right? We have someone who uh, is in their real life a, a long integer, right? Who has a value in various things. But for the time being, um, I would like them to act in the role of a string. Um, I would like them to act in this other role and create this other representation of this variable. Um, we'll look at casting, I think, a little bit more later. Um, but this is just a really easy way to let the code know, hey, I actually, I don't care what the, the number value of this is, treat this like text. So we'll upload that back to the Arduino. And now when we do, we'll open our serial monitor. And this time we should see, ah, so I still have a print statement instead of a print line statement, right? So it was concatenating everything next to each other. Now, if I upload a print line statement, let's clear our output here. There we go. So now we have all in one line, the current time is and the value of our milli statement, right? Does that sort of make sense? I, I think it pretty much does. Um, yeah, so that is the that is the gist of serial communication. I'm, I've got a couple more demos to do, but first let's take a quick quick pause for questions. Um, baud rate is also called the symbol rate, which is the same. Can you output, can I output pizza, Chris? Don't you challenge me. Yes, of course we can output pizza. Um, and the way I might do it, is I might say serial.println pizza. That would be a really easy way to do it. Um, this delay function here is, by the way, is not strictly speaking necessary. Um, we could shorten these things up quite a bit. And now if I open my serial monitor, we'll see that about hundred times a second, we're printing pizza. I don't know if you can see this scroll bar down here freaking out, but uh, we're just saying pizza over and over again, which I guess really is all that I'm doing on this stream anyway, is saying pizza over and over again, apparently. Um, but yes, challenge accepted, there's your pizza. Mm. Um, so to combine our, that's a lot of pizza, yes. Um, to combine this idea of serial output with some of the concepts we already know, um, let us do uh, a quick demo with how we might sort of use this to evaluate the state of our hardware. Um, so I'm going to take our switch from last time and our Arduino, I'm going to hook up one half the switch or one side of the switch to ground and one side to uh, pin eight, let's say. It uh, could be any digital input pin. I'm gonna pick pin eight just for uh, convenience sake. Uh, and because I can, I don't think I have a drawing of this one, but you'll just have to trust me that this switch is connected to ground in pin eight. I think it's pretty visible there. Um, 
And I'm gonna come back over here to our code. And uh, instead of spitting out the time, what I will do is say uh, int uh, value equals digital read uh, pin eight, right? I guess I should probably define that as a variable if I'm being a good boy. So I'll say int uh, switch pin equals eight semicolon. And down here, I will say switch pin, right? So I'm gonna take the value of that switch pin. And of course, as always, I'm going to use the pin mode function uh, on the switch pin to make it an input pull-up type. As we talked about last time, right, that internal pull-up is sort of going to gently pull that pin to high uh, so that it always has a defined value. And then when I close that switch to ground, it's going to snap to ground, right? And then when I open that switch, it's going to flow back to high, right? Just a way of making sure that that, that, that point of connection always has a definitely defined voltage, right? It lets us connect switches between pins and ground in a really easy way. Input pull-up, right? So back down in here in our loop code, now that I have our digital reading, I can do something with it. So I might do that with an if then statement. I will say if value equal equals high, uh, I will serial dot print line, uh, the pin is high. Uh, and uh, if it's not, right, I'll use my else statement to say serial dot print line, the pin is low. And if I haven't made any typos, and fingers crossed I haven't, I'll upload that. Oh, you know what I should do is <laughs> I should put some delay in there a little bit because now it's just sending this as fast as possible. Although you'll get the idea, right? If I come back over here and I close the switch, you can see that value changing. The reason it appears to happen instantaneously across the whole screen, of course, is because it's printing this as fast as it humanly can. Maybe not humanly, it's a computer. Um, but let's put a small delay in there just so this is a little bit more readable open our serial monitor, and now only 20 times a second, you'll see that it's outputting the value of the pin. Chris asks, is there a way to print only when it changes? Yes, Chris, there is. Um, there are a couple of different ways, but this one, this is actually a great tangent to go on um, because doing something when something changes um, is a really common design pattern. Um, and I'm gonna show you sort of a, a common way to do it here. Let's, let's not delete all of our code too readily here. Um, so I'm actually going to do a couple things. I'm going to define uh, my value variable out here, just so I have it ready. I'm gonna delete that int down here. Right? I'm just gonna assign a value down here. And I'm gonna define a new integer called previous value, right? Um, and so what I'm going to do in every loop is update the value that the pin is seeing, right? I'm gonna take this digital read on the switch pin and store it in value. And at the end of my loop, I'm going to say previous value equals value, right? So I'm gonna have the new value of the pin in this loop. I'm going to have its previous value also stored, right? So what we're really asking is, you know, if we're, if we're looking to print something only when something changes, what I'm really saying is I want to print something uh, when the current value and the previous value are different. Um, so uh, what I might do uh, is say if value not equals previous value and open a new if statement that wraps up this whole shubin shebang uh, into uh, a new loop, right? So if the value is not equal to the previous value, if and, if and only if that is true, am I going to enter into this printing code? And then if the new value, right, if the current value is high, uh, I might say the, swin the pin got switched to high. And likewise, I might say, the pin got switched to low when that changes. So if I haven't made any typos there, right, we'll open our serial monitor back up, right? And now you can see, ah, yeah, good, we're not outputting anything, right? But if I flip this switch, the pin got switched to high. And then if I flip it back, the pin got switched to low. So this idea of storing a previous value and comparing it to the current one is a really useful design pattern, right? Where, um, if you're thinking about looking for something changing, what you're really saying is, uh, I'm looking for a value now that's different than it was a moment ago, if that sort of makes sense, yeah? Um, I think I referenced last time um, there, uh, there was a, a, a slightly different structure called interrupts, um, which is a hardware way of looking for changes. Uh, on the Arduino hardware, especially on the Uno, you only get, uh, get those on a certain number of pins. So again, I, I wanna get that example right, and I, I'm gonna think I'm gonna push it back another week. 
Um, Kenneth notes, let's see, what does Kenneth say? Important to note the delay means adding 50 milliseconds so the print doesn't happen every 50 milliseconds, but 50 milliseconds plus however long it else the code takes, so it's a little bit slower. Ah, that's a really good example. So this is a, a good example of code structure that can let us get rid of this delay function here, because we added that in so that we weren't just printing something as fast as we possibly could, but now we're only printing when things change, so I can get rid of that. Good catch, Kenneth. Yeah, so let's upload that there. We will open our serial monitor. And again, we shouldn't be printing anything because nothing's changing over here. But when I flip the switch, the switch got changed to high. When I flip it low, aha, I was hoping that would happen. Um, so uh, we flip the switch low and we got low, high, low, high, low, high. Whoa, that's not what we wanted. We wanted a singular transition, right? So uh, what's happening there is switch bouncing. Um, Basically, inside a physical switch or button or what have you, uh, what we'd like to have happen, of course, is when I move that physical lever from one position to another, uh, I would have two bits of metal that would be open, would be non-contacted, and then would slam shut. And then when I uh, move the lever in the opposite position, those two pieces of copper would move apart. But in actuality, right, when, we, when we're thinking about things happening in terms of milliseconds and microseconds, when those copper pieces come together, it's not uncommon for them to touch touch, 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 right? And in the sense of an Arduino, which is thinking about things in fractions of a second, that might be a transition from low to high, low, high, low, high, low, high, low. And that's exactly what we're seeing on the screen here, right? Let me clear that output and we can see it again, right? When I flip this switch, right, it seems to open pretty well. It went from low to high pretty cleanly, but when I close it, we're getting some bounce. Um, and there are a few ways of dealing with bounce, um, which occurs in basically any physical switch, any contact switch that you're looking at. Um, one way that's really worth looking at is if you go into your examples, you go into uh, digital, there is an example called debounce, um, which uh, will give you an example. I see if this uses the debounce library. No, this is just making use of last change time. Oh, that's right. Um, there's a library called debounce that you can use to sort of do some of this for you, but, but let's write it by hand because that will be good for learning. Um, so I'm going to introduce a new variable called long uh, last change time up here in my, in my previous code. And I'm going to say it starts at zero. And what that variable is going to do is track the last time I saw the switch change. And then we can use some uh, heuristics for ourselves to say, well, a human being is not going to change the position of a switch more than, I don't know, maybe 10 times a second or something. Uh, and so if we're seeing that switch change faster than that, it must be bounce. In fact, we can define that heuristic by, say, um, a new variable called, uh, let's call it min, min switch time equals 10. So here's how we're going to make use of that. Um, in my code here, uh, I've got this comparison, right? This is where we're evaluating whether the switch has moved positions. Like if value is not equal to previous value. If that's true, I want my last change time to be equal to the current time. I'm going to track that something has changed. Um, uh, and what I want to do then is say, right, I'm. this is the last time that I'm allowing my switch to change. And so up here in my if that's enabling this to happen, I'm going to add another condition. We looked at this double ampersand last time as well, you remember, right? This, this is the and operator, right? Which means we only get to do this if statement uh, if this side of things is true and whatever's over here is also true, right? And on this side, I'm going to say last change time is uh, greater than the current time plus the minimum switch time, if that makes sense, right? So let's walk through this, right? So uh, this is going to be a value from millis, right? A number of milliseconds since the program has started, right? Uh, I'm only going to jump into this code if uh, I am further along in my code than uh, than the the last time that I changed things uh, plus the current switch time. Actually, I think I've got this backwards, right? Minus. Oh, let's see. So if the current time, which I just said, is further along, there we go. Current uh, than last switch. Time. Yes. So uh, we switched at, say, a thousand milliseconds into our code. So I only want to be uh, doing a new switch action if the current time is greater than, say, a thousand milliseconds into our code plus 10 more milliseconds. Does that sort of make sense? So we're we're using the current time to evaluate whether, like, if, if something should have been, if something should allow something to switch or not, right? Um, if I haven't messed this up, let's upload that. Oop, last switch time was not declared in this scope. Oh, I called it last change time. There we go. 
upload that. We'll open our, oops, error opening COM port 11. Oh no, why won't you open COM port 11? Let's try that again. <laughs> There we go, now it's uploading fine. Sometimes the Arduino just farts on you. That just happens. Um, let's open our serial monitor now. We'll clear our output from last time. And if everything's gone right, when I switch this, we should see high and low. High. Oh, we've got two high transitions there. Isn't that interesting? So probably what that means is, right, we had a little bit of bounce there. So, uh, you know, this there was a bounce that was lasting more than 10 milliseconds. So maybe my debounce time needs to be 100 milliseconds, right? So we can just change this min switch time variable here. Right, so now when I'm switching things, I've got things nice and clean. Right, so that's a really uh, sort of straightforward way in software to um, to debounce your switches. Right, which is to make sure that things are only changing as fast as you want them to. This pattern of um, if the cur it only do something if the current time is. Uh, greater than the last time I did something uh, plus the minimum amount of spacing between them is a pattern that I use a lot in coding, especially to sort of um, rate limit inputs, right? If you're thinking about uh, switches or um, uh, anything that might give you a hard content input, maybe you have a rotary encoder, which is giving you inputs clicking through on a wheel very, very fast. I, I might not want to be accepting input that fast. So I might only jump into my code in my if block here if the current time uh, has, if enough time has elapsed, in other words, since the last time I did something and that amount of time elapsed is defined by minimum switch time. It's kind of a convoluted example, but I, I think a useful tangent for us to go on. Let's jump back to questions for just a real, a real quick sec. Um, use lots of presenters, uh, lots of parentheses when using operators like and to make the logic extra clear. Yeah, you really can't hurt yourself by adding too many parentheses, as Kenneth points out. Um, Chris says, more code but no delay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, this is just another way of, right, because I, I could have uh, input uh, into my code, right? I could have seen an input and then delayed for 100 milliseconds, right? That would be one way of not accepting another input. But again, the further we get away from this delay function into using this millis function and, and thinking about time, the more we're going to allow our code to do. Here's, before we, we move on, that's actually the, the metaphor I've been thinking of to go back to, to the Palmer question, as I'll, I'll always think of it now, is how do you get a, a piece of code to wait for something? Um, is to think about how you do things in your daily life, right? If the things I'm going to do in my day are eat breakfast, eat lunch, and eat dinner, uh, and I know I do that at 9 a.m., 1 p.m., and 6 p.m. I don't uh, eat breakfast at 9 a.m. and then say, well, now I'm going to sit here for three and a half hours and do nothing, and then I know it must be 1 p.m., and I will eat my lunch, and then I will sit here for another four hours, right? What you do is you eat breakfast, and then you go about your day periodically looking at the clock, and when the clock says one, then you know it's time to eat lunch. And then you're going to go about your day doing other things, running other code. And when the clock says six, then you know it's time to eat dinner, right? So if you're thinking about um, ways to let code do multiple things at once or, or wait for something to happen, when you think about waiting for something to happen, don't think sitting on your butt doing nothing. Think keeping an eye on the clock. All right. So let's see what else I had on the to-do list for tonight. Um, we looked at serial, we looked at digital input. Oh, let's look about, let's talk about serial the other way, right? Let's talk about doing serial communication from the computer to the Arduino. I think that will be quite interesting. Um, so um, let's start a new piece of code. There we go. Um, so like before, I'm going to start by doing serial dot begin, uh, 115200. That's just my preferred value. This could be 9600, right? Um, I should say sending serial information is not free, right? It does take some clock cycles to actually send those bits from the Arduino to the computer or vice versa. Um, so you do have to be a little cognizant that if you start inserting serial communication into your code, you are going to change the timing of that code. And for some timing specific things like outputting RS-485 or DMX or uh, dimming things at a very high rate, inserting serial commands may actually slow your code down enough to change the behavior of that code, which is not necessarily what you want, but just something to be cautious of there. Um, so um, uh, now I've got my serial started. Um, here's how I'm going to take serial input from the computer. I'm going to, I'm going to say uh, if, and in my if block, I'm going to say if serial.available um, serial.available, right, in my if block here, is true if there is a something waiting for me coming into the serial port, into the UART, right? So 
in this situation, right, I'm going to, if I, if there's nothing in this serial port, this if statement is false, I'm just going to loop around forever waiting for something to be there. Um, but if there is something there, here's what I'd like to do. I will say, um, uh, let's see, let's do int value equals serial dot read. Uh, and then just so we can see what it's doing, I'm going to use our, our delay function just to give it a little space. And then I'm going to serial dot print line value. So what this will do here, right, is when there's something in the serial port, I'm going to do this serial.read function, and serial.read takes in one byte, one chunk of information from the serial port. I'm going to store it in this value. I'm going to delay for five milliseconds, and then I'm going to print it right back out that same serial port. So when we send something, we should see it come right back to us. So let's upload that. That's going to make me save again. Always making me save. I'll call this read demo. Upload that. Let's see. Chris says, Jeff needs servo-controlled cameras for next week. <laughs> or Mary is a camera operator, says Kenneth. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. Um, an error occurred while uploading this. Oh, I probably tried to upload this sketch twice, which it, it doesn't, doesn't like at all. So we're done uploading, right? So I'm going to open my serial monitor. I'm going to make sure my baud rate is still 115200. Um, it, down here, um, I have my line ending setting. Um, let's set it to... Uh, both NL and CR. And we'll get to what that means in a second. That's the default. I've been messing around with this a little bit, so my, my settings are not default anymore. Um, so, but I have my code set up that it should see something on the serial report, read it in, and spit it right back out at me. So let's try uh, sending the letter capital A. Well, that's not capital A at all. How about capital B? How about capital C? How about capital D? Well, that's not what we want. What we have is 65, 13, 10, 66, 13, 10, 67, 13, 10, and so on which is certainly not A, B, C, D, but there is at least a regularity to what's going on here, right? 65, 66, 67, A, B, C, what's happening here? Well, what's happening here is this serial.read function, I said, takes a byte of information, a certain uh, eight bytes, uh, uh, eight bits, a certain small chunk of data. Um, and when I do serial.read, it's going to read it very, very literally. Um, and it's going to interpret it according to this, the ASCII table, an ASCII, uh, is the, from the, I don't know, Kenneth will probably know, 60s, 50s, 70s? Um, a chart of when people got together and said, well, we're going to have to assign letters and digits and symbols to uh, the number of ones and zeros in a byte. Um, how are we going to do it? And this is the standard table. I literally, every time I need to reference this table, I Google ASCII charts and I just pull one of these up. Um, this is just an image I got off of Google Images. But we'll see here, if I come over and I find capital A, in decimal, I have 65, capital B, decimal 66, and so on, right? So when I spit back in A, when I do serial.read, the program is interpreting that very literally as the decimal number 65, and then spitting that right back out at me, like I asked to. So in a way, it's doing what I asked, it's just not doing what I intended. So let's take a look at what else is going on here. So I got that number 65, 66, 67. So those were A, B, C, D interpreted as bytes. I'm also getting this 13 and this 10, What's that about? Well, you remember that I came down here and I changed my new line setting to both NL and CR at the bottom of my screen here? If I look at the ASCII values for 13 and 10, oops, come back, 13 here, and it might be a little hard to see, but I encourage you to Google ASCII chart and look at this as well. Um, 13 corresponds to this CR, this carriage feed character, and 10 re uh, refers to this line feed character. This is literally the characters that tell your computer to start a new line of printing, right? When I told you earlier that the print line command sends some symbols to your computer to tell it to start on a new line when it's printing, it's literally sending these, a line feed or a carriage feed, or in our cases, both. Uh, when we're sending data back to the Arduino, we get to choose which of those are included and which ones aren't. So if I come back to our serial monitor here, if I come down to our, I know you can't see this because the text is so small, but if I come down here to this line ending setting and I say no line ending, when I send the letter A, I just get back 65, B is 66, C is 67, D is 68, and so on, right? I'm not sending those two additional line feed characters. Depending on the code that you're writing, sometimes you will want to send them, and sometimes you won't, and we'll get into that in a sec. Um, but in the but before we do that, let's get this to spit back A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D instead of 65 through 68. Um, so uh, what I am going to change here is I'm going to... Uh, instead of using read, I'm going to use read string. Uh, and that's going to let us send text data to the Arduino and then spit it right back out at us. Because I'm going to read a string, right, I'm not going to want to assign it to an integer. I'm going to want to make it a string. 
Um, so I say string value equals serial dot read string, delay, and then print value, right? Um, let's upload that. And once it's uploaded, we'll open our serial monitor again. And in this case, I do need to enable at least one of my new line characters. Now, why is that? Well, a string, like let's say I wanted to send hello world exclamation point. And again, I apologize for the, straw, the small text size, right? When I send that, I should get back hello world. If I type, uh, I am the queen of France, it will spit back, I am the queen of France. Um, the reason that we had to enable our new line characters down here is, of course, this string, hello world, isn't one continuous message. It's actually a byte of the letter H and a byte of the letter lowercase e and then L and then O. And the only way that the Arduino knows that you're done sending data to it is when it sees that new line character, that carriage return or that form feed character that we were looking at. So read string, actually, what it's doing is taking in byte after byte after byte until it sees that new line and then it says, oh, we must be done. Now I will uh, hand that off to the rest of my code, if that makes sense. Um, the reason we have two line feeds here, of course, is that I have both new line and carriage return turned on. If I enter uh, goodbye world with just a new line, now I only get one one return. All right, we can see that if we enter more text. Oh, we can still get both. How interesting. Well, I'm wrong about something then. Um, but in any case, you, when you're sending strings to the Arduino, you typically want to do it with a new line and you'll use this read string function. Let's take a quick question break. Let's see. My settings are not default anymore. It's the most Jeff Glass sentence ever. Yes, that's true. Um, ooh, Kenneth information. The American Standard Code for Informational Interchange, or ASCII, was developed in 1960 because before that, every computer was coming up with their own way to store the alphabet and it was the worst. Um, uh, Chris says we can use the buttons on the Arduino to act as a keyboard and keystroke. You sort of can, yeah. So we could say, um, in fact, let's do a little bit of a demo. So let's come back to our previous code over here. Um, and let's, so this was the code that was on a change in, oh no, uh, on a change in the switch, we're gonna print one of two things, right? So I'm gonna delete some of the code related to the switching and time. And I'm going to make sure that we've started our serial in our setup function here. And we have, which is good. Um, and instead of doing this, if value equal equals high, I'm going to wrap this whole thing in our uh, if serial.available block, right? So we're only going to do this if there's something on the serial port that's of interest to us. I can get rid of this previous value. And we'll make sure that our uh, our curly brackets line up. Here's an interesting thing you've probably noticed if you worked with the Arduino IDE. If you have your cursor next to a curly bracket, it will highlight for you the matching curly bracket. I think you can see that here, yeah. So when I put my cursor next to this curly bracket, it tells me the matching one is this. It's a really easy way to spot whether you're missing a curly bracket, right? I know that this curly bracket up here by loop should match my last one down here, but currently it's matching to nothing. So I must be missing something. So else is matched, if is matched. Ah, this serial.available, it seems to be matching to this end of our loop function here. So I know I'm missing a curly bracket, right? So now that's all lining up. Um, so inside my serial.available uh, command here, I'm going to say, uh, let's say string value equals serial.read string, right? So that's going to capture uh, a string from our thing. Um, and then uh, I'll do it wrong first and then I'll fix it. So I might start by saying if value equals uh, high, I'm going to, let's not print back to the, to the uh, well, no, let's, let's print back to the command line here, right? And I will say, um, I saw the value high. And if I get anything else in the serial port, I'm going to say, uh, I didn't see high frowny face, right? So all this is gonna say is if I send the exact string H-I-G-H, -H, uh, it will print back to me that I, I said that. If I say anything else, it's going to say, no, I didn't see that, I'm very sad. So if I upload that, let's see here. Let's clear our output from last time. And I'm going to say Jeff. And it's going to say, I didn't see hi. I'm going to say Bob. And it's going to say, I didn't see hi. I'm going to say hi, and I know you can't see it, but I'm gonna type capital H-I-G-H. -H, and it's going to say, I didn't see high. Now, why is that? Well, this comparison operator here, this double equals operator that we've been using is actually not the right way to compare strings to each other. Um, for that, we actually have another function called compare to. And when you're comparing strings to each other, you want to use this compare to function. Um, the 
technical reason why, and I might be botching this, but you know, Kenneth's here, so I really don't have to worry too much about accuracy, um, is when you say value equal equals high, uh, the Arduino is going to create those that string, that exact series of letters high in memory, and then compare that value in memory to my variable. But because they're in different places in storage, they're never going to be equal. Whereas this compare to function actually compares a string to a string the way that I want to. Ooh, did I undo that? There we go. Let's try that one more time. So we'll upload that. We'll come to our loop, we'll clear our output. And once again, if I say in my input here, Jeff, oops. Oh, <laughs> I, I screwed it up again, right? So compare to, yeah, compares whether a string is before or after another one alphabetically. What I meant, and I'm so sorry, is the equals function. That makes a little more sense, doesn't it? <laughs> so we'll upload that. We'll open our serial monitor and I'll say, Jeff, uh, I didn't see hi. If I say hi, I didn't see hi. What the hell? What gives? I thought I said hi. Maybe I mean high with single quotes. I don't think I do, but let's find out. We'll upload that. If, if this is another demo that I've messed up because I, <laughs> because I have gotten something fundamentally wrong, I'll be very sad, but I don't think I am. <laughs> oh dear. In any case, this is the way you would compare strings to each other. It's using this equals function. Let's see if I, let's see if I prepared this demo in advance too. Let's see here. <laughs> uh, I bet I did. That was my LED demo. Let's open one more. Uh, da, da, da. Well, someday we'll do a whole, we'll do a whole debugging stream where I just take code that's broken and we try and fix it together. Maybe mine or maybe yours. New lines are included in the string, kind of says. Oh, maybe. Uh, let's see, hi slash r slash n. Uh, this is the notation for that, that carriage return and new line character here. Um, so our theory of operations might be that it's comparing to seeing exactly that. Let's try that again. It's carriage return new line and hi. Hey, there we go. Yes. So that was a really good catch, Kenneth. So uh, when I'm sending H-I-G-H and hitting enter out of my serial command, the string that's actually coming in is H-I-G-H plus a carriage return plus a new line, right? So uh, if I make it just a new line in my serial monitor, I could do just a new line in my string. This backslash N is how you record a new line. Backslash R is a carriage return, right? So if I type Jeff, I should see not the value high. If I do H-I-G-H, I see the value high. Great. Problem solved on the screen. Thanks, Kenneth. I super appreciate it. Um, so that is uh, the basis of how you send strings back and forth to the Arduino. Let's do one more data type and then we'll move along to analog input. So um, there is, just like there is read string to get specifically string information into the Arduino, there is a value called parse int. Uh, which is for getting integers into the Arduino. So let's go back to our basic example here. We'll say value equals parse int. We'll delay five milliseconds, and then we will print line our value right back to us. Right. So upload that. And now when I open my serial command, right, remember before if I, I was getting bytes back through represented values. Now if I send a one, I get a one. If I enter 123, I get 123. So when you're sending uh, data in the form of integers to the Arduino, what you really want to be using is parse int to read that in. If you read it in as a string, it won't know it's a number. It'll just know it's the digits, say one, two, three. Uh, if you read it in as bytes, it'll be uh, translated through that ASCII table, which is certainly not what you want. Um, you'll see again here, right? I had the number one and then the zero. I had 123 and a zero. And that's of course, because I have my new lines turned on. So if I turn my line ending off, right? I should be able to send in a thousand and twenty one two three four, and it comes back as the number one, two, three, four. Make sense? Swell. Um, questions, I know that was, that was a lot. And I know I stumbled a couple times there. Questions before I move along to uh, analog input. Mm. Can I suggest using single letter commands for uh, any kind of serial command? I think it's a good idea. Um, if you're writing a bit of code on your uh, computer that's communicating with your Arduino, trying to send the word um, do the thing now is uh, a lot more cumbersome than saying, uh, you know, D, 
and then maybe following it with a number that tells you how long to D for. Chris is almost 90 minutes. Did I say 90 minutes this time? I lied about it last time, so I figured I wouldn't say it this time. But if I did, I lied again. We're going to keep charging on. Um, let's talk about analog input. So we did analog output where uh, we looked at a uh, how the Arduino can create something like at least a variable voltage on its output range between 0 and 5. We also have a way of reading a, a voltage between 0 and 5 volts into the Arduino and acting on that information. And here's how that works. Come back over here. Um, so here's a comparison between digital input and analog input, right? On the digital side here, we're familiar with this chart by now, right? Anything between 3 volts and 5 volts gives you a high, 0 to 1.5 is low, and in between is I mean, you're not sure what you're going to get. On the analog input side, we have 10 bits of resolution. What that means is uh, when we use our analog input circuitry, uh, what we're going to get back in our code is a number between 0 and 1023, right? 1024 possible values for this input or 2 to the 10th because we have 10 bits. Um, so 2.5 volts would be about 512. Uh, 3 volts would be about 6 or 700, right? Um, and often we're not so much interested in exactly a, a specific voltage level, although certainly we are. Um, but if you were doing something like creating um, a voltmeter-like circuit, you probably wouldn't do it directly with the Arduino's analog inputs. There's more specialized and more precise circuitry for that. No, typically what we're interested is sort of where in the range from 0 to 5 volts are we approximately. Um, so there are many types of hardware that can create this kind of output voltage, uh, but the first one I'm going to show off is something called a potentiometer. Um, and a potentiometer, for someone who hasn't seen it before, is one of these little guys, um, also called a little knobby do. Um, this is a three terminal device with a little knob. If you've ever seen like a sound mixing board or um, a, a volume knob on uh, an older style radio, right? Not the radio in your car, right? That can click continuously, click, 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 click. But one that sort of has a low range and a high range, it's almost certainly a potentiometer in there. So what's going on inside this potentiometer? Well, I took one apart for you. And in here, here's what we have. Um, the three terminals on the output side here are connected internally like so. You see we have uh, the outer pins are connected to this strip of resistive material. It's similar to the material that's inside of a resistor that's doing current limiting. This middle pin here is not connected directly to that, but there is this little wiper circuit that as we, that's connected to the knob on the front, so that as we turn that knob, this little nub in there changes its position uh, along that piece of resistive material. So what that means is this. Uh, if the wiper, let me get a little indicator here just to illustrate. If the wiper is closer to this side of things, that means between the center pin and this pin is a very small resistance, and between the center pin and this pin is all of the rest of this resistance, right? And as I turn that knob, the position of that wiper is going to change, right? So in the middle, I have an equal amount of resistance between the center pin and the left and the center pin and the right. And as I continue to turn it all the way to this limit, right, when I get all the way over here, I have a very small resistance between this pin and the middle pin, and a very large resistance between the middle pin and this side. Uh, and I can use that resistance to uh, determine, essentially, where in the knob's travel we are. Um, those two things will basically form what's called a voltage divider. And in case you haven't run across this before, um, what we are going to do is put 5 volts across our resistor. We're going to hook the, the uh, outside pins of our potentiometer, one to five volts and one to ground. And then we're going to read the voltage on the middle pin. And you can sort of think about if that, that uh, resistor between five volts and our output is very small, uh, we're going to be essentially sucked up to five volts and the large resistor to ground is not really going to do much. We're not going to have much pull in that direction. But as that resistor that's connected to five volts gets larger and the resistor to ground gets smaller, we're going to have that middle voltage pulled down to ground more and more strongly because there'll be less resistance between our pin and ground. Right? So the circuit we're going to use to demonstrate this looks like this. Uh, I'm going to put my LED back on digital pin 3, and I'm going to hook my potentiometer. Uh, one side will go to 5 volts, one side will go to ground, and the middle pin will go to pin A0 on my Arduino. So let's take a second and get that hooked up now. Take my switch apart. 
and I've got my potentiometer here. I could do this on the breadboard. Today's circuit is going to be simple enough that I, I think I'm just going to hook it right in. So my outer pins are going to go to 5 volts here and ground just here. And then my middle wire, this white wire, is going to go to A0. There we go. So now let's look at a little code to do something with that. Um, we will start a new bit of code. And I will say, we'll define where our connections are as always, right? We'll do int LED pin equals three, where it always has been. I'll do int uh, pot pin, potentiometer pin, equals A0. When you're working with the analog pins, these do have uh, names that are, are in sequence with the digital ones, but you can also just say pin A0 and the Arduino knows what it is, right? Um, in setup, I'm going to define uh, my, uh, my inputs and my outputs. So as usual, I'm gonna do my pin mode, LED pin output. And I'm going to define my pot pin as just an input, right? Because of course, I don't want to be pulling that. I want to do an input pull up. I don't want to be pulling that pin to five volts. I want it to be itself and I want to read its value. Um, and I'm going to use the serial console that we just learned about uh, to show you what its output is. So here's what I'm going to do down in my loop. I'm going to uh, say int value equals analog read uh, pot pin serial.println value and delay, I don't know, 100, uh, I don't know, 50. <laughs> um, so what's happening here? Well, this analog read function should, should look a whole lot like a digital read function. It's uh, taking reading an analog value uh, from the pin that our pot is connected to and printing it out to the serial console. Oops, got to save it. We'll call that pot pin. And once we're uploaded, I'm going to upload, I'm going to uh, open our serial monitor, and you can see the current value coming out of our uh, analog pin is 598. But if I come over here and I turn this pot in one direction, you'll see that value going down to zero when I'm all the way one way. And then as I turn it the other way, you'll see that value going all the way up to 1023. That's the gist of analog input, right? I, the, as the voltage on that middle pin of that potentiometer changes, the uh, relative range from zero to 1023 between zero and five volts will change. And the analog pin is sensing that and giving me a value here. Neat. Uh, so what can we do with that? Well, what if we wanted to make a dimmer, right? That simply when I change the value, when I change the position of this pot pin, and Chris says we're transitioning to the map function. Yeah, we sure are. Um, I want to uh, dim an LED uh, to correspond to the position of this potentiometer. So let's hook up an LED. Oh, I said I was going to hook up an LED before, but now I'm going to do it for real. Right? I'm going to hook up my LED uh, between ground and pin three, like before. Right? My current lane was a... And of course, it's doing nothing yet because we haven't told it to. Um, but... Uh, here's what I can do. So uh, let's see. Let's do uh, the naive version of this first. And we'll keep it writing to serial so we can sort of see what's happening in the meantime. Right? I'm going to say int value equals analog read pot pin, uh, analog write uh, LED pin value. And let's upload that. So it will gladly let me upload it. All right? I'll open my serial monitor over here so we can see what it's doing. I think you can see the LED all right over here. Um, let's turn this all the way down. As I turn it up, watch what happens. It's... Uh, as I turn it up, right, it gets brighter and brighter, but when I pass 256, it goes back to zero. And this tracks with the behavior we saw from analog right earlier, right? If you give it a value bigger than 255, it's going to modulo that function or wrap that function around for you, right? But that's not really the behavior I want, right? As I turn this all the way down, I sort of get four different ranges of fading. Um, and I really want it to be just a continuous range. Uh, when I spin this pin all the way down, it's dim. When I spin it all the way up, it's all the way bright, right? So for this, we're going to use, as Chris has so rightly guessed, the map function. Uh, and here's how the map function works. Um, I'm going to define a new variable called mapped value. Uh, and it's going to take the value of the map function. The map function takes five arguments, and they are as follows, right? I, what I would like is to take... Uh, I'm, I'm getting this input from my potentiometer between 0 and 1,023. And really, what I'd like is a value that's equivalent to that, but smushed down into the range 0 to 255, right? I want it to sort of take this entire expanse and smoosh it down into the range that the analog write function accepts. And the map function does just that. So uh, I'm going to say map the value. Uh, the starting range is 0 to 1,023, 
and the ending range is 0 to 255. And this is going to accomplish that smooshing function for me, right? It's going to take, well, you know, say the, this map value, wherever it is in this range from 0 to 1023, find the proportional place in 0 to 255. And now we should see, as I change the potentiometer, right? Oops. Let's see. Did I not upload it? <laughs> that wouldn't be so good. It's also possible that I've gotten the order of the variables wrong. Oh, no, you know what I did? I didn't change this right here. I'm still writing my original value to the LED when I want to write my mapped value. I like to show these sort of mistakes just so it feels more <laughs> personal. <laughs> or I just screw things up, right? So here we go. So now, as I spin the potentiometer all the way one way, when I'm all at zero, it's all the way dim. And when I dial it all the way up, it's all the way bright. So the map function is super useful for uh, well, mapping one range of values to another. This is also a really easy way if you've installed your potentiometer backward, right? Let me show you what I mean, right? Right now, uh, it's counterclockwise is lower, clockwise is higher, just like a clock face, right? But let's say I uh, want this to operate the other way. Well, what I could do is say, I'm gonna map the values zero to 1023 to the values 255 to zero. And this will do my inverting for me, right? I'm going to uh, basically smoosh and invert my range of values. So now you can see over here, zero is as on as possible. And when that potentiometer is all the way the other way, 1023 is off because 1023 now maps to zero and zero maps to 255, if that sort of makes sense. It's kind of a useful thing. Um, yeah, we can't see the knobby do. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Let me zoom out a little bit here. There we go. Three cameras, Tyler, like still not seeing what he's talking about. Yeah, I, if you saw everything, where would the mystery be? Ah, uh, well. Um, I'll make sure you can see it when I do my, my next little demo, um, which is just to say that um, this kind of potentiometer is called a rotary potentiometer for obvious reasons, right? It rotates. Um, but there are other kinds of potentiometers as well, namely... Things like this. <laughs> you can see I wrote on it long ago, uh, about 50 kilo ohm slide pot. Um, this is a linear potentiometer. And much like the rotary potentiometer, it has a strip of resistive material inside it. And when you move this slider, which is attached to this pin here, uh, the amount of resistance between uh, the middle pin and an M pin changes in proportion to the amount of slide. And so this will work exactly like a rotary potentiometer. So I'll hook that up real quick and show you how that goes. Let's see. Probably from American Science and Surplus, says Chris. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty likely. <laughs> All right, so there we go. So now I have my linear potentiometer plugged in and on camera. And as I move it from one end to the other, you can see things change there, right? If I open up my serial monitor, I'm not sure you can see that over there, but you can at least see that the values are changing, right? There's 2023 and there's zero. Right? So if you're thinking about um, control surfaces for your devices, using a potentiometer as a knob or using a linear potentiometer as a, a control surface is a really easy way to get a variable into your code. Now, right now we're using that as a variable to directly control an analog value, but it doesn't have to be, right? We could say something like, um, let's see. So we've got our input value here. Let's keep, um, let's keep that and we'll keep printing it out to the serial port but let's we could do something very simple like uh if value is greater than i don't know 1023 divided by two digital right led pin high else digital right led pin low did i capitalize led pin i did not led pin and led pin so this will basically say when our potentiometer is below half, turn the LED off. When it's above half, turn the LED on, right? So now I've turned an analog input into basically a digital input. Um, so th this would be a way, you, you can imagine a situation in which we might have, uh, uh, ah, we might have multiple, oh my gosh, we might have multiple uh, ranges within this analog input that do something, something like this. Um, let's say if value is less, is greater than uh, 800, write high, else write low. Uh, let's see, um, let's incorporate a new concept here called uh, else if, right? We can chain together these if statements, right? If value is greater than 800, do this thing. Otherwise, if uh, value is less than 200, we'll make it low. 
And if it's not, right, if it's between either of those things, we will write the mapped value of value 1023, uh, the same map function that we did before that's going to constrain, going to map our input value into the dimmable range. Oops, to void, oh, going to have to analog write to the LED pin that value. All right, so we'll load that up. We'll open this, we'll come back to the table. And now, right, when I'm at one end of the range, I'm fully off. We'll be off until we hit a certain point. We dim, we get brighter and brighter and brighter, and then we snap to high. Snap to dimming, snap off. So this may be useful if you're thinking about uh, using a knob as a control surface in one of your projects. It might be useful to say, you know, if, does my user really need to turn that knob all the way to zero and exactly zero every time? Or would it be good? a little bit of fudge factor, right? If that knob was within 10% uh, of the end where it ranges in my reading value, um, I could say I want 200 to be my low value for my map and 800 to be my high value for my map. And in that way, when I adjust my potentiometer, right, when I get to 200, I will start dimming from zero, a very low level, come up and smoothly get all the way to high. Chris says it would be easier to hook up the switch to turn the LED on and off. Well, yeah, Chris, it sure would. <laughs> it sure or in 45 minutes into the night. So we may save uh, uh, examples for another time. Questions at this point? Anyone out there in the universe? Um, I'd be happy to take them. You can start, you can, um, what was I going to say? Oh, you can think about, um, other ways that you might affect analog input with analog sensors, right? A lot of sensors out there just change their resistance based on some kind of incoming uh, parameter, whether that's an incoming light level, whether that's an incoming sound level. Um, and then uh, you can use this same circuitry to sense the incoming voltage from that sensor, and that will uh, can change the behavior within your code, right? So, um, and like I say, we'll get to that at some point, I'm sure. Kenneth says, we just need five volts and a switch to turn it on and off for LEDs. Yeah, if we just wanted to switch an LED, that this this would be a little bit of an overcomplication. Um, but in our situation, I think this is a, a fun learning thing. Um, all right, let's move on to the last topic, I think, that I promised for tonight, which is the tone function. So uh, to do that, I'm going to need a little bit of additional hardware, specifically a buzzer module, one of these guys. Um, and these buzzer modules come in two different forms, active and passive buzzers. Um, they look very different. This is a passive buzzer. This is an active buzzer. They look exactly the same. Um, there is some differences in the internal circuitry, um, but there is, uh, there is uh, really no visual difference between them. So as you, if you get a kit that has both of them, them, try and keep them separated, or you'll have to do what I did last night and try and poke at them to, uh, to tell them what they were. Chris says constrain. Oh, we'll get back to constrain. Um, as a function that we can write in our code. Um, so these uh, buzzer modules, here is how you wire them up. I think I should have a circuit diagram for this. Yeah, it's real simple. Um, I'm going to attach the buzzer module. I'm gonna attach one side of it to uh, pin eight and the other side to ground. It does not matter which for a passive buzzer module. Buzzer module. Let's see, make sure I get these connections right in my breadboard. There we go. Oops, that's wrong. <laughs> this is the problem with these DuPont connectors is when you put too much force to them, they can snap apart like that. So I'm just going to use a bit of wire. So we're going to attach one side to pin eight and get in there. We'll attach the other side to ground. Mine is a, uh, a, three, a three terminal module and yours may be two. Um, the middle terminal is not necessary. The internet will sometimes tell you that it is, but I guarantee that it's not. So attach that to, what I say, ground. Now, I'm going to turn off the background music, and I think, well, and when we get to playing things, I'm going to turn off the background music, so we'll play a little bit in silence, but I think my mic is going to pick up this, this tone module. If it doesn't, tell me, and we'll figure out how to get it on there, right? So let us start a new bit of code. I'm going to save it in advance this time. I'm going to call it uh, Tone Demo 1. And here's how it works. Um, I'm going to say int buzzer pin equals eight. And then in my setup this time, uh, in my setup, because I'm only gonna run this once, I'm going to say tone uh, eight, four, 40. I think that's, uh, I'm missing a parameter here. 
Um, let me show you a little behind the scenes of what I would do if I've forgotten how to do something, of course. I'm going to go into the Arduino reference at arduino.dc, resources, reference. And this has literally all of the functions that you could possibly use in your code. If I come down to the tone function here, it reminds me how the tone function works, which is really great. Um, so it tells me the tone function takes two uh, two or three parameters, either the pin and the frequency or the pin, the frequency, and the duration. So if I call my tone function with pin eight and value 440, if I turn the background music off, there we go, and I upload this code, we should hear Can you hear that? It's really annoying. I have like six seconds of lag. So from the moment you tell me you can hear it, I'm gonna listen to eight more seconds. Yeah? No? Now we can't hear the music either. Doesn't sound like the Mario theme. Here, let me try a little bit of a stronger demo. Can says tone? Oh God, thank goodness I can stop it. <laughs> oh, pretty obnoxious there, huh? Excellent, good. Oh, that was a really like, really like finger on the button latency test. <laughs> um, good. Well, we can hear things, so that'll be that'll be good for our progress. So before I plug that back in, um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, write a little bit more code that'll be a little bit more interesting in terms of functionality. Um, so um, one thing that's nice about the tone function. So what what is the tone function doing first of all? So it's going to uh, put out an oscillating square wave, a tone, a musical note, on the pin of our choice at the frequency of our choice. 440 is just middle A. I, that's just something I know. Um, so that's going to play a middle A on a piano, and this tone function is going to do it forever or until I give it another value. So in my setup function here, right, so this is only going to happen once. I'm going to say tone 8 uh, 540 and then delay for another second. And then when I'm done, I'm gonna call this no tone function, which is going to stop everything so that we're not just hearing buzzing uh, for the rest of the stream, which I think uh, might make everyone leave and that would be a real shame. So if I, oops, what's that error? Upload, error processing at, oh, no tone, I think takes a pin number as well. No, what's happening? How bizarre. Well, we go back to the <laughs> we can go back to the reference and we can say, what does the no tone take? No tone takes a pin. Error opening, I'm getting an error opening and uploading code to the app. That's so strange. Why is that happening? Can I upload anything else? If so, I may just have to restart my Arduino RDE. That happens sometimes. Yeah, I think I'm I think it's getting confused. Oh, it's because people. It's because I haven't plugged the thing back in. Yeah, Kenneth, Kenneth, you called it. You called it just as I noticed it. Well, so Kenneth is uh, one lag, one stream lag ahead of me in figuring out what to do. Excellent. All right. All right, we'll turn the background music off. We'll upload the code. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I'm also unplugged here. I happened to unplug this wire. Yeah, let's plug that back in. Uh, let's see, we'll upload our tone demo again, and we should hear. Boo -doo. Right, so that is our four, uh, 440 hertz tone for a second, our 540 hertz tone for a second, and the tone set off. And then because we put this in our setup function over here, uh, that uh, only runs once and then never happens again. If I were to put this code though in our loop function and upload that, you would see it's going to play those tones over and over again forever and ever and ever. And that's going to be a real bummer. Um, so <laughs> let's unplug that and remember that it's unplugged, uh, if we're lucky. Um, and let me show you a slightly easier way to write, uh, some, some tones in Arduino code, right? We saw that this tone function takes, uh, two or three parameters, uh, one of which is the pin, one of which is the frequency, and one of which is the duration. So I could also have written the duration of those tones into this command. So tone, unlike all the other functions that we've seen, uh, does not block other code from executing while it is happening, right? It's not that we're going to hang here in this tone command uh, while we're while we're playing it. Um, we're going to move right along. So in order for this to be heard, I'm still going to have to have this delay function here. Oops. Plug it back in. Upload. Wait for it to upload. It'll cut off while it uploads, which is great. And then... So same function. So you can see we're not... 
playing for a thousand milliseconds and then delaying for a thousand milliseconds. We are uh, playing for setting up the tone generator basically to play for a thousand milliseconds. And then for our purpose, we're just going to wait a thousand milliseconds before we start the next tone. Chris says, could you take the value of the potentiometer and set the tone? I sure can. Um, oh God. <laughs> um, while I do that, let's turn some hip jams back on. But yes, Chris, we absolutely can do that. So let's take our rotary potentiometer from wherever I stashed it earlier. And similarly as before, I'm going to hook one side up to ground, one side up to uh, five volts, just there, and one side up to A0 again, and then we'll write some code for it. So coming over to our code, right? First, I'm going to define where our pot is plugged in on A0, and then I'm going to set it up as a input with the pin mode function. I forgot I had to find buzzer pin up here, so I didn't need to use eight. Well, naughty Jeff. Um, so here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to say in my loop, I'm going to say tone on my buzzer pin. Uh, and then I'm going to, I could just, let's just start with the value of the pot pin proper. Um, and then we will have that play for, uh, we actually, we can, because we're going to be updating this frequently, I should be able to just let this run. I'm going to insert a small delay of 10 milliseconds here, just as it's only updating 100 times a second, only because if this is updating millions of times a second, I have a feeling that the tone generator is not actually going to produce any sound. That's a hunch, but I, I think that's true. So let's update that there. Oh, plug the Arduino back in. $10. Chris, uh, Chris Wick in the chat has bet $10 that my Arduino will become unplugged and I would forget. And uh, Chris, uh, that's uh, $10. So congratulations. So now let's upload that code. Come back to the table. Make sure that everything's on camera. And now, yeah, I think what's happening here is I'm actually updating that tone too frequently, right? I'm not giving the Arduino a chance to uh, to actually establish the tone because I'm updating that tone 100 times a second and that's just too much. So let's come back over here to our code and let's say we're only going to change that value uh, every half a second and then we'll work our way down from there and determine what the limits of the tone function are. It's kind of fun. Oops. Let's see, what is not working? So I have five volts and ground. Oh, well, what helped him was connected, that's for sure. Um, here, this will be a great example, as we're doing things on the fly, to show us how serial commands can help us to debug a circuit. So let's start up our serial port here. Oh, <laughs> this is why. It's because I'm using the value pot pin, which is A0, which is like 20, instead of analog read of the pot pin. I was already to launch into the whole thing about serial and debugging and how that can take up extra time, but no, it's just a typo. <laughs> All right. Chris guess pin connected wrong, always a good guess. There we go. So now every half a second, it's updating. And now that things are actually coded correctly, I'll bet we can change this delay value here to something a little bit smaller. Let's say uh, 20 times a second. Let's see if that's worked. That might, uh, might be still a little bit too fast for that tone generator, but let's find out. There we go. The world's worst synthesizer. Right, so that's a real simple combination of how you could combine your analog input with your sound generator. Um, so I promised you uh, a couple things tonight that I haven't talked about, one of which is an explanation of the constrain function. God, this is awful here. That's maybe the least awful. Um, <laughs> new background music for the channel? No, I don't think so. Um, let's use the constrain function to limit, right? When I get down very low here, that's kind of an awful low note. And when I get very high, oh, I hate that note too. Let's say I never want this to go outside of certain bounds. So I'm unplugging it. I swear, I'm going to remember this time. Um, let me show you how to limit the range of your input to a certain uh, a certain range of values. So um, let's first of all, let's take this analog read out of the inside of this function and define it as its own variable here. We'll say int value equals analog read pot pin. We'll just store that in a variable. Uh, and then uh, let's modify a little bit by saying value equals constrain, constrain value 
uh, the lowest it can possibly be, right? The lowest the analog rate could possibly be is zero, but for our tone function, let's say it's gonna be 100 hertz. And uh, for the highest value, let's say it's gonna be 600 hertz, just so we can hear that really clearly. Oop, I'm not plugged in. But it I took me, you guys, it took me less than half a second to remember that. Oop, and I, of course, have a typo. And down here, oh, and of course I have to add that value into my tone function there. There we go. This is a nice thing, like a lot of times it's like, make a small adjustment in code, re-upload. Make a small adjustment in code, re-upload, right? So now we'll see, we'll come back to the table, you'll see a little better. Now, when I turn this knob past a certain point, nothing changes, right? Down in the low end here, any value between zero and 100 doesn't actually do anything. And similarly on the high end, above a certain range, nothing actually changes. Put your switch in line with the buzzer as a mute switch? I certainly could. All right, we'll detach that. That's the beauty of doing these things on a breadboard, is it's super, super easy to make wiring changes. I would also, this is bad I, bad practice on my part, I would always recommend unplugging your Arduino before you make these kind of changes, um, because you never want to stray wire to cross over to something else and uh, accidentally short something and now you could have fried your Arduino, and I have done that. Um, I actually have a secondary Arduino sitting just off camera here um, because I'm afraid that at some point I'm going to mess up some of the wiring and fry it. Let's put this switch in here, right? So now I have my switch in line and I can cut it off whenever I want. Palmer, Palmer is a consummate sound professional. And then he forgets to flip the switch. Yeah, this is maybe just adding another point of failure. So again, we could have certainly done this switch in software, but we're gonna do it in hardware um, just because uh, that'll be nice, great. Uh, so that's the constrained function, right? That limits the value of a variable to being between the two secondary values, right? If value is less than 100, uh, which we're going to set it to 100. If it's more than 600, we will let it be a max of 600. If it's in between, then we will let it sort of stay as itself, right? That's the constrained function. Um, Chris in the chat keeps requesting the Harry Potter theme, and I, I don't have that teed up for you here. Um, but what I do have teed up for you here is an explanation of arrays. Um, so an array is essentially a list of values. Um, there are many times in coding when you might think about storing a list of information uh, in a structured way as opposed to encode it, remembering individual, um, individual values of information. And a good example is a series of notes in turn, right? Chris is asking for the Harry Potter theme and I'm not gonna look up the notes to the Harry Potter theme, um, but uh, you can imagine a situation where I don't really wanna say like, Here's a dumb way to write it. I could say int note one equals 440 hertz. Int note two equals 540 hertz. Int note three equals 700 hertz, right? It would take all day, and whenever I wanted to change anything, I would have to come up with new names for variables and then call them one at a time. That's not the way I want to do things. So instead, I'm going to introduce an array with this kind of syntax. I'm going to call int uh, closed straight brackets notes equals open curly brackets uh, 440, 540, 700, let's say for the three numbers it did. Close curly brackets and end. So this defines a new structure, an array of integers called notes. So we have a list of integers now that is named notes that I can reference as follows. Let's get rid of some of this analog read. And I'm going to say, let's do this in our, let's see, we'll do it in our loop so we can hear it over and over again. So what I'm going to say is, uh, tone, right? Tone takes a pin, right? So we'll do buzzer pin. And the note value, I'm gonna say notes and then zero. So this is going to take the zeroth position of this list. And the zeroth position is this starting position here. I think I mentioned earlier, a lot of things in programming start counting from zeros where zero is the first thing. So position zero of this list is this 440, right? I'm gonna delay, just so you can hear what's going on. We'll delay half a second and then Let's play the other two tones. Doo, 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 doo. We'll play a buzzer pin note one, delay half a second, note two, delay half a second. Uh, and actually after this third one, let's delay uh, two seconds. So that last, that third note will really be sustained. I'm pretty sure this is how the Harry Potter theme goes, um, but let's play it out loud and find out. My Arduino is plugged in, my switch is on. <laughs> let's upload. Oops, is that right? Yeah, let's see, upload. Unqualified ID before token. I got a little programming error over here. Uh, let's see. What have I screwed up now? Tone. Did I call it the wrong thing? I, I've got some sort of typo in here that I will need to find. Notes was not declared in this scope. 
Oh, I think I just got this uh, syntax wrong. There we go. Notes. Chris says in three. Yeah, Chris clocked it. When you're defining an array in an, Ar in an Arduino bit of code, it often expects you, you can say, you can actually give it literally the number of members that it has, or if you leave those brackets empty, you can, it will just count the number that you're assigning to them, right? So if you listen now, It's the Harry Potter theme. We did it. Uh, well done for us. So this is just stepping through that, that array one at a time and referencing those values individually. Um, but now that we have that information stored in an array, um, there is a more structured way that we can access it. Thank you for Palmer Jenkins for this switch. Ah, so good. Um, rather than individually in each line of code putting in zero and one and two, we can use a for loop to access this information in a structured way. So, I'm going to write a new for loop and we will say for int i equals zero, i is less than three, our number of notes, i plus plus, we'll do our for loop. But this should look familiar right now, right? We're gonna run through this three times. And in this case, I'm inside this for loop each time, I'm going to do tone, buzzer pin, notes, and then I'm actually going to use that variable much like we did for our analog output function earlier. I'm gonna use that as the uh, index of our array, right? So I'm going to do a tone with note zero, then a tone with note one, then a tone with note two, and then we'll be equal to three and we'll move on, right? And within this as well, I'm going to add that delay function in. And then once I'm done, I'm going to add an additional amount of delay, right? I'm going to delay 500 milliseconds and I really want that third note to hold on there. I think that's the, really the genius of the Harry Potter theme is that there's that long sustained third note at 700 hertz, which we like a lot. So we come back over here. There we go. Um, so now, we, now we're doing the same thing, but now instead of having to say, uh, you know, note zero, note one, note two, I can use this array index to uh, jump through each of those array indices for me. Um, it is probably a good idea in this situation, right? I have this, you know, I'm saying in this for loop here that I have three notes. It's probably better for me to notate up by my array how many notes I have, right? So if I was up here, say, adding additional tones, right? If I was going to play uh, the, the, the interlude in the Harry Potter theme, which is a tone at 450 hertz and a tone at 320 hertz, I could just change this num notes value. And then here in my for loop definition, I would also change that number of notes. There's a, a slightly cleverer way to do this, which I'll show you in a sec, but just so you get the idea. Right, I'm gonna turn my switch back on. Right, so that's the, the continuation of the Harry Potter theme that we all know so well from the movies, is it goes, -da 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 -da. right? So now we have five notes and we're all just, we're doing them all through just one single call to the tone function inside this for loop. I'll turn that off, because it's, it's truly awful. <laughs> Um, so there is one, uh, you know, if we're, if we're thinking about making modifications to this, right, I could keep inputting notes to the Harry Potter theme all day long if I wanted to, right? I, I know that by heart. Um, but it would be kind of a pain if each time I did, I had to manually count them and update this num notes value. There is a way to do this automatically and I'll show you what it is. Um, there is a function called size of, uh, that will help us out here, but it's not gonna do exactly what you think, right? I've got how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I have eight members of this array, right? Size of is not actually going to give us the number of members of the array. It's going to give us the length of this array in memory, right? In, in number of bytes that it takes to store this array in memory. And since an integer takes more than one byte, this is actually gonna return not eight, but I believe 16, uh, for the, the number of bytes that our array contains. There's a clever hack around this though, which is to say, uh, I'm gonna take the total size of the array and divide it by the size of a singular member of the array, right? So if I have, uh, this array takes 16 bytes, a single item takes, well, two bytes for this integer here. Now I'm going to know that my number of notes is eight bytes. So now that should allow me to, oops, what did I do? Array, oh, well, how was if I call this notes and not array? I'll upload that. We'll come back to the table, turn the music off, turn the switch on. Yeah, that's the Hedwig theme right there, for sure. 
Chris, isn't there a way to count the number in the array? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Yeah, so this is this remembering to do not size of, but size of divided by the size of the object itself is really important so that you get the uh, the, the number of objects in the array, which is typically what you want, um, and not the size of the array in memory. This is truly god awful. Um, as a little antidote to our awful tone thing, I will say, as always, there are great examples in the Arduino code editor. If you go into examples, uh, let's see, where is our tone? Oh yeah, digital, and then tone melody is a great example. So let's look at this tone melody code together real quick, right? They've defined a, uh, they've defined an external file called pitches, which they've just taken a time to write out what every pitch on the keyboard is, right? And then they can make an array of those values, right? So our melody is going to be C4, G4, G3, and so on. They made another array of the durations that those notes should be play for. And then once, and they're doing this in setups, right? So it'll only do it once. Uh, we're gonna use a for loop to move over that array and play each note on pin eight uh, with that note and that duration. And then it's actually gonna take a little bit of a pause in between notes just to separate them out a little bit. So let's upload their example and just see what it does. And come back over here. Hey, do you hear that? Let me try it again. And to play it again, I'm just hitting the reset button on the Arduino here. Remember the reset button run, just basically starts our code over from scratch, runs the setup function and then runs the loop function over and over again. There it is. So that's a really easy way to think about using arrays to store data in a structured way and reference them in your code. And with that, I, the tone function is the last thing on the syllabus for this evening. So I'm gonna take another sip of uh, the Bodum that I have here from Half Acre. Uh, and open it up to any final questions. The question I want to think about, um, I want you to think about is what, um, what would you, how would you like to go about, one thing that I'm interested in is people sharing what they're doing. I'm seeing a lot of people out there reaching out to me and posting in places like, you know, here's a project that I'm taking on, here's where I'm, I'm hitting a wall, here's all these things. Um, and so what I'm thinking is, uh, in a week and a half, right, so not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, uh, April 8th, I'd like to do a sharing stream where we share interesting things, um, things that people are working on, Arduino-based or circuit-based or things like that. Um, and I'm not quite sure what format to do that in. Um, I really like doing it on stream um, because it allows those who really just want to watch to be passive participants, um, as opposed to something like a Zoom call, although it could be a Zoom call on stream um, or Google Hangout or something like that. Um, so anyway, I'm not really sure what, what format to take there, but think about that over the course of the next week. Um, and uh, next Sunday night, we will, uh, we'll, I'd, love to, I'd love to hear what you think. Um, and also think about if there's anything that you would want to share or show off. Um, and uh, next week when we come together, I want to hear about it. I want to figure out how to get you guys sharing some things. Um, Next week, speaking of things that I think we're going to get into, so we've done uh, a fair amount of these sort of basic, you know, inputs and outputs. We've done switches and LEDs and knobs, and really, honestly, a lot of programming and experimenting has to do with these sort of basics, inputs and outputs. Um, but what I would like to do is uh, kick things up to high power. Um, I would like to spend next week looking at servo motors, uh, stepper motors, and I'd like to look at uh, the basics of using transistors and FETs to switch high-powered circuits or higher current circuits than the Arduino will natively handle. Um, we will probably come up with a couple of programming topics to go along with those as well as I flesh out what those examples are. Um, but next week we are going to uh, see if we can get the Arduino really driving the bus uh, and making some big things happen, making things happen in physical space. Those of you who are interested in like mechanics and mechatronics, like I think that will be, I think we'll have a really fun time next week. And I've got some some fun toys hiding around here that we can pull out and play with as we're as we're working with servo motors and uh, and stepper motors um, and high power LEDs. Frankly, um, those of you, some of you were here in a live stream long ago when I burned my fingers on a very hot LED. That might happen again next week. We'll see what happens. Um, but in the meantime, thank you again for joining us this Sunday night. I know this was a lot to get to, and I, I flubbed a couple of times. But you know, as we get deeper into the subject matter, I'm going to just turn out to not be an expert in anything off the top of my head, and we're just going to figure things out together. Um, so think about what uh, what you might like to share. Think about what format you think that would be good in. Um, and I will see you next Sunday night, same bat time, same bat channel, 7 p.m. Central here on YouTube. 
Um, those who haven't don't use YouTube a lot, if you hit the subscribe button, you'll get a notification when that stream is scheduled, and you will also be able to access all of these past streams are just archived on uh, archived on YouTube. So if you've missed this one, if you miss one later, you can always come back to my channel and watch them all here. I will work on getting the code for uh, for last week and this week posted on my website at jeff.glass blog. We'll find the, the right way to, to organize that information there. Um, and in the meantime, thanks again for a great Sunday night. I, uh, I hope you're hanging in out there. I am with my Bodum from Hack Ever Brewery here in Chicago. <laughs> uh, thanks, y'all. Uh, I'll see you next week.